Chair McMillan, you can go ahead and start. We are live. Thank you, Becca. Oh, I call to order the uh, September 2020 meeting of the Finance and Operations Committee of the University of Minnesota's Board of Regents. <coughs> Haven't used one of those in a while. Tom, know if they still work. So. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Thank you to those of you who are joining us live via the, uh, the, the live stream video and those attending us uh, joining those attending in our boardroom on the Twin Cities campus. They're the ones that are live. The ones on the stream are attending virtually. Thank you to everybody. Most of us are connected virtually today, but several regions are participating from here in this hybrid format. Our protocol will remain much the same as our previous all electronic meetings. So just a couple reminders um, in that department. First of all, we will continue to keep everyone muted to reduce background noise. For those on Zoom, uh, the regents, if you wish to ask a question or make a comment, or anyone on the staff and the administration use the raise hand feature within Zoom, staff will keep, staff being Jason, will keep a speaker's list uh, for me. When I call on you, please unmute yourself. All votes are, need to be recorded by roll call as required by Minnesota law. And finally, I'll remind everyone again that today's meeting is live streamed and it will be archived on our website for uh, future viewing. With the start of the uh, new academic year, we also have uh, new student representatives with us today, Sia Buttar and uh, Laura DeMuth, but I don't believe either of them is able to uh, be here yet. They're having some technical difficulties. Apparently when they are able to join, we will recognize them and, uh, and and make sure that uh, that they're engaged here. Hopefully, we can get that resolved. With uh, with that, let's turn to our agenda. And item number one on our agenda is the uh, discussion of our work plan for the academic year in which we find ourselves already engaged. I uh, note at the outset that the plan was designed to provide us with significant flexibility as we continue to address the impacts of COVID-19 and provide input to President Gable and her team as they start to implement the system-wide strategic plan. In addition, in addition, Vice Chair Beeson and I have made it a priority to include a number of discussions focused on human resources, led by Interim Vice President Ken Horstman, including a major item we have before us today. With that, Interim Senior Vice President Tonneson, is there anything else you'd like to highlight from the, uh, the work plan before I seek any input from, uh, from my colleagues? Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair, members members of the committee. Uh, just a couple of things. I also wanted to emphasize that there are this year additional HR-related items, uh, not only this month, but in February and in May. Uh, that was a priority uh, for the committee. The flexibility issue with new leadership coming in, I think, is important. I do want to mention we're, we're starting up right away in October with something new on the finance side in terms of updating the committee on the current year budget, which we don't do in a, I will call, old normal year, uh, but we're doing that this year. But yet we are still allowing for a lot of opportunity to talk about development of the FY22 budget. So that's in there. Uh, the placeholders for the strategic <clears throat> plan, as you mentioned. And then just finally, we are continuing to provide a lot of reading material for the committee with uh, information items every month that we hope are helpful to you as you go about your work. So it is a very robust agenda. Uh, with that, Mr. Chair, that's that's all I would choose to highlight right now. Thank you, uh, Interim Vice President Tonneson. Uh, Mr. Langworthy, any uh, input from our colleagues? I don't see anyone wishing to speak right now, Chair McMillan. All right. I do see um, one of our our student reps here. So maybe we, at this point we can, uh, I don't know if uh, Sia Buttar is here, but I do see Laura DeMuth, a returning second year student rep. And uh, why don't we go to you now to introduce yourself since uh, we missed you at the very outset. Go ahead. Awesome. Hi there, everyone. My name is Alora DeMuth, and I'm currently a senior at the University of Minnesota Crookston studying agricultural education and communication. And as our chair said, this is my second year as a student representative. Outstanding. And thank you for your, your commitment to uh, governance and, uh, and leadership. And uh, we look forward to your input. We don't have your colleague yet online, so we'll pick that up uh, later. 
All right, we don't need uh, action on the work plan. Obviously, that is a document that uh, that is dynamic, and in this year, anything that isn't dynamic isn't going to work. So, we can move on to uh, uh, the first of a number of review items that uh, that uh, we don't have action on today, but they're big ticket items. And the first one is the 2020 six-year capital plan and the 2021 state capital request. And uh, this is a formal review of the president's recommended six-year plan. And I invite President Gable, Provost Croson, and uh, Vice President Bertelson to present the plan. And uh, we will start with President Gable. Thank you, Chair McMillan, Vice Chair Beeson, members of the committee. As part of Board of Regents policy, the administration is directed to develop a capital budget with a six-year time horizon updated annually. Members of the committee, our 2021 state capital request is identical to the request brought before the state in 2020, just adjusted for inflation. As will be described in greater detail in just a few moments, the first priority remains funding in at $200 million for HEFER. The next two projects were first presented in the 2019 state capital request and include the child development replacement on the Twin Cities campus and the renovation of A.B. Anderson Hall in Duluth. The fourth project introduced last year is a chemistry and undergraduate teaching facility on the Twin Cities campus. The over 353 million projects, uh, 353 million in projects represent just over 302 million from the state and just over 51 million from the university. Also included is a renewal of the university's request to refinance outstanding bonds issued to fund the biodiscovery district on the Twin Cities campus. This will result in savings estimated at 27 million, which would be used to acquire land and complete design for a clinical research facility on the Twin Cities campus. Members of the committee, although the legislature was unable to reach an agreement on a capital investment bonding bill thus far, we are still deeply committed to working with our state lawmakers and partners towards critical fundraising for infrastructure projects across the state, including these buildings and investments at the University of Minnesota. We believe a capital investment in the university is an investment in our state. It's an investment in Minnesota students who become workforce ready graduates and leaders. It's an investment in discovery and in research and in cures by our world class faculty who transform our state and our society as a whole. It's an investment in critical infrastructure, shoring up our buildings while putting resources directly into the hands of local contractors who would work on our projects across all of the campuses. So we look forward to taking important next steps towards this endeavor in the weeks and days ahead. Mr. Chair, Executive Vice President and Provost Rachel Croson and Vice President Mike Bertelson are here to discuss our request in more detail. Thank you. Thank you, President Gable. Pre uh, Provost Croson, I assume you're next. Uh, I actually believe that Mike Bertelson is going to uh, start. Vice President Bertelson, welcome uh, to the uh, committee and uh, go ahead. Uh, good morning and thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, President Gable. Let's begin. Uh, next slide, please. As the President said, the six year plan is required by board policy and is used to set direction for major capital projects. This plan provides for flexibility in later years. The six year plan includes several placeholders that give the President and the Provost opportunities to make strategic decisions about the future of capital projects. The plan also includes a list of projects that are under consideration in order to provide the board with a clear picture of the broader pipeline of projects that may come before you in the coming years. Next slide. There are two primary forces that inform the plan. First and foremost are mission priorities. These are gathered from university deans and chancellors and then prioritized by senior leadership. We also collect and analyze our facility priorities based on their conditions. The facility and mission needs are balanced against available resources to arrive at the plan before you. <clears throat> Next slide, please. These six-year plan priorities have largely been consistent for the past several years. We will speak to each priority briefly in the following slides. Next slide. Let's begin with the plan's first priority, addressing the university's poor and critical facility backlog. We aspire to be a world-class university, but we cannot achieve or sustain that without important investments in our facilities. Next slide. We have a massive $12.9 billion facility portfolio, and 50% of our buildings are over 50 years old. 
8.7 million square feet of the space is now considered poor or critical. And you can see that in the share of each circle in red. And that figure continues to grow each year, as you can see in the, the, slot, the chart. Collectively, we have projected $4.9 billion of facility need to, that should be addressed over the next 10 years. Next slide. How are we doing funding this need? What this chart illustrates is that we rely largely on unpredictable sources of funding to meet that need, HEPR and major asset re reinvestment through the state capital request. The yellow range on this graph represents facility renewal investment targets. The bottom line indicates a minimum amount of funding necessary to hold ground on facility conditions. And the upper line indicates the target to make progress on reducing our facility renewal need. Repair and renewal funds and HEPR form the foundation of renewal funds for the university, of which we are averaging $40 million a year of investment. Asset reinvestments represent all other facility renewal at the university. Mainly these are projects funded by the state capital request and internal university funded renovations. As you can see, we have not been making our target investment most years. So an estimated $600 million has been added to our facility need backlog over the last 10 year period. Next slide. Our building by building strategy analyzes each building across several measures to determine which we must prioritize as keepers and which we have a lower priority for the long haul. This plan is particularly useful identifying and limiting incre incremental investments into buildings that no longer have strategic value at the university. This is also important as we continue to look for ways to control our facility portfolio and increase our space utilization. Next slide. We remain hopeful that the state will continue its partnership with us and provide significant HEPR funding. HEPR is our main tool to address poor and critical space. We have a large list of projects that we could tackle with our $200 million request. In the end, the project list will be scaled to match the funding available. Many of the larger higher impact projects like Duluth Chemistry Building Renewal or Mechanical Engineering Phase 3 on the Twin Cities campus will not be feasible without a large heaper allocation. I turn now to Provost Croson for the next several slides and other priorities within the six-year plan. Thank you, Vice President Bertelson and uh, Provost Croson. Thank you, Chair McMillan. Thank you, Regents. Can you please go to the next slide? The University of Minnesota has one of the most comprehensive health science centers in the nation and trains 70% of the healthcare professionals in Minnesota. A clear building block of the reimagined health sciences opened its doors this spring. HSEC is the first project outcome of Governor Dayton's Blue Ribbon Commission and brings together students to learn in modern classrooms, laboratories, and simulation centers. The next project imagined in the Blue Ribbon Commission report is a clinical research facility. The 2021 state request will seek funds to complete design of this facility, followed by a request for full construction funding in 2022. Finally, major HEPR investments are planned for all years to address deferred renewal in many of the core health science facilities. Please advance to the next slide. The facility condition assessment work done by University Services indicates that some of our most deficient laboratory facilities are located on the St. Paul campus. Investments in St. Paul teaching and research laboratories remain a high priority. Renewal of existing facilities, both partial and whole buildings, will be the primary investment tool. The potential exists for demolition and replacement of facilities that are in poor or critical condition, obsolete in their design with little reuse potential, and that have significant maintenance and operations costs. The plan includes the major new investment for the College of Biological Sciences Microbial Cell Production Facility, approved for design in this year's annual capital budget and has on the list of potential investments the pending grant proposal for Biomade. Please advance to the next slide. Chemistry is a core component of both STEM programs, and the U does not have an adequate supply of space to meet demand and move students through the necessary course sequences. 
the UMD Haikala Chemistry Advanced Material Science Building was the first in this series of investments, providing desperately needed chemistry teaching facilities for the Duluth campus. The plan before you includes a major investment in 2022 to repurpose obsolete teaching and research labs in Duluth's old chemistry building. The 2021 state request also seeks funding to address the same shortfalls with undergraduate chemistry teaching capacity in the Twin Cities campus. The new Twin Cities chemistry teaching facility would replace and improve upon outdated facilities currently spread inefficiently amidst research labs in multiple locations throughout Kolthoff and Smith, serve 3,300 undergraduate students per semester, accommodate a 14% increase in chemistry enrollment while reducing lab section sizes by nearly 15%. The Lind Hall Capital Renewal is a building-wide innovation renovation that will create a single academic home for industrial and systems engineering, as well as classrooms, computer labs, and student services <clears throat> to serve the College of Science and Engineering and university-wide teaching and learning needs. Finally, HEPER, the plan includes several investments into STEM facilities, including a high priority investment into mechanical engineering to finalize a three-phase facility renewal program, as well as the food science and nutrition building on the St. Paul campus. Please advance to the next slide. The use and purpose of our libraries continues to evolve. Mobile and collaborative trends have changed how students, faculty, and the public use our facilities. Libraries are less and less places to store and retrieve information. Instead, libraries are service centers and gathering places for curating and creating. We see this in the new design for the biomedical library constructed as part of the Health Sciences Education Center opening this spring. Here we see faculty commons, where faculty can explore new teaching methods and experiment with the same technology in the classrooms, computer visualization labs, technology-rich infrastructure for manipulating large data sets, like studying of, of epidemics, one-button studios, where students and faculty can record their own presentations, and consult rooms where library staff can meet with faculty, staff, and students on special projects and two small group study spaces. <clears throat> Finally, the new library includes maker spaces with 3D printers and other technology. This plan again calls for relocating lesser used materials to an off-site collections facility. Opportunities exist within the plan for uh, opportunities within the plan include placeholders for investments in Wilson Library. St. Paul McGrath, and University of Minnesota Morris Briggs Library. Now I'm going to hand it back to Mike to talk about our request. Vice President Bertelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As you see, this is the same request that you approved and we advocated for this past session, only updated for construction inflation. The president has already summarized this at the beginning of the meeting, so I won't repeat it now. Next slide. In summary, this is what the six-year plan financing profile would look like. This summary includes state request projects as well as university-funded line item projects. It does not include university-funded R&R. This concludes the, our presentation to you, and we are glad to take your questions. Well, thank you, uh, all three of you. And before I turn to Mr. Langworthy to see which... Uh, Regents we have with questions and comments. I've got a, a question slash comment of my own. And uh, looking at slide, I think it's 45 in our docket materials, but it's the catch up, keep up, sustain, and do not invest slide, Mr. that uh, the Vice President Bertelson walked through. I guess I'd, I'd appreciate a little more um, background or context, perhaps from the President, about how we build into our system-wide strategic plan a bigger commitment to start to perhaps, you know, eliminate pieces of our, of our footprint because at some point we have to do that. We've got to let go and move on. And I don't quite know how that works and I'm not looking for a detailed answer, but President Gable, if you can fold that in perhaps to strategic planning and the broader look, that'd be really helpful. 
Yes, thank you, Chair McMillan. So uh, when I and my colleagues describe HEPR and the specific projects, we're talking about strategic investments in learning and in research and in opportunities for students and in faculty discovery. But part of the strategic plan also reflects an umbrella of stewardship of our resources and thinking about our um, real estate portfolio in that context. So a few months ago, VP Bertelson's team began the process of master planning and bringing in um, outside expertise to look at our entire aggregated footprint and our use of that so in addition to the financial picture and the sort of algorithm that we use to look at space that um, VP Bertelsen presented, we're also looking strategically at what it is we hope to accomplish related to our mission and how we're executing it through the strategic plan and where there are opportunities for either efficiency or actual change, downsize or otherwise as appropriate. That's what we're looking for the master plan to guide us through and expect that that would be a part of the outcome at the appropriate time. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Langworthy, do we have some interest? Regent Swiggum would like an opportunity to speak. Regent Swiggum, right here in the same room as me. <laughs> Regent Thank Swiggum, you. you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, for VP Bertelson, if I could, uh, like many, I was disappointed <clears throat> that the legislature couldn't get together and come together on a, on a bonding bill this year. Uh, However, I know one of the things we talk about over the legislature is shovel-ready shovel projects. So when they do get together and they do get a chance to uh, uh, maybe pass some uh, bonding bill legislation, <clears throat> are there things we can do either in acquiring land and or design work or anything, Mike, to make sure that we can tell the legislature this project, you appropriate the money, uh, in the bonding bill, we can get shovels, we can get bulldozers or whatever scaffolding there tomorrow. So we're ready to go. It's shovel ready. Are, are we preparing for that uh, kind of a scenario to make sure we can tell uh, the folks over in St. Paul this project can go tomorrow when you uh, when you appropriate the money? Vice President Bertelson. Um, Mr. Chair, Regent Swigum, um, yes, we are taking actions uh, to do just that. Um, both for ICD and chem teaching. <clears throat> um, we are continuing to advance design in spite with university funds and don donor funds um, so that those projects are even further ready um, the moment that the legislature would act. So we would be further along, we are further along and more prepared to um, dig in the ground and as you say, be shovel ready. That's also true for a variety of heaper projects. It's always tricky to know how many of those HEPA projects to be fully ready, but many of those are fully designed and ready to just award um, to a contractor to begin immediately. Um, in addition to that, for the CRF project, we are continuing um, and as you have already been approving some land acquisitions and are continuing that process to make sure that we are fully ready for these projects should the legislature act and give us funds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mike. I think it's absolutely imperative that we be prepared to uh, to tell our friends over in the legislature we're ready to go tomorrow. It's shovel ready. Thank you, Regent uh, Swigum. I know I've we've got a request from uh, from uh, Regent Powell as well. Regent Powell. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Chair McMillan. Just a quick question. I believe it's for uh, Mr. Bertelson. Uh, we mentioned that the biodiscovery uh, district, uh, that there's a refinancing opportunity there that could, um, you know, be very, very beneficial. I think he said 26 or $27 million. Uh, could we just have a little bit of commentary on, uh, you know, how much is being uh, refinanced, uh, current rates, and, and, you know, what sort of the approach that we'll be taking there? It sounds like a very, very good opportunity for us. <clears throat> um, Mr. President Chair, Bertelson, sorry, Regent, uh, Mr. Chair and Regent Powell, um, for details of that, I have to, would have to uh, call a friend and have um, Mr. Volna, who's behind all the refinancing. So maybe if um, someone can prepare him for that. I'll just say in short, um, um, obviously the exact dollar amount and saving opportunities vary with the debt rate that's out there. But um, you're right, it is a significant amount, um, enough that would advance and pay for um, much of the land acquisition and design of the CRF building. 
So I don't know the exact uh, details of the refinancing. That's something Mr. Volna um, has been working on and is um, thoroughly um, prepared for. Thanks to the uh, marvels of technology here, I can see that uh, Vice President Volna is indeed here and I saw him reaching for some papers, so I'm sure he's well informed and he's ready to go. Mr. Volna. Chair McMillan, um, members of the committee, thank you. Um, uh, Vice President Burleson is correct that the um, amount of the actual refinancing and savings does vary as the markets vary and as interest rates vary. Um, the last time we uh, looked at this, which was actually after these materials were presented, the markets had again moved in a favorable manner. Um, and the current estimate of the refinancing savings is in the neighborhood of about $30 million. Um, the amount, th this pertains to uh, two or three different series of debt that was issued on the biomedical discovery district. Um, I was trying to quickly add up the three of those. I don't have it right with me. Um, I will give you that number uh, later on in the presentation when I have an opportunity to talk about the debt policy. Follow up, Regent Paul. Uh, thanks, to re uh, Chair McMillan. Only that it sounds like uh, sooner is better than later, and, and maybe there's an opportunity to advance this one. It sounds like there are, there's quite a bit at stake if we can kind of move on it. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Uh, I see that uh, we have Regent Shu uh, has a question or Regent Shu. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, presenters. Um, I would like to get some more information on the uh, number 316 East Bank Capital Renewal. I see that that is uh, the new project uh, for the armory. And um, I, I am disappointed that the armory has now slipped from 2021 to 2024, uh, but I would like to get some more information about that if you have it. Thank you. Uh, Vice President Bertelson. Guessing um, Mr. That Chair, you're, uh, um, your first Mr. Chair on Regent, that. Yes, thank you. Mr. Chair, Regent Shu. Um, yes, we are disappointed as well for the delay um, without the shift of the not having a bonding bill this year has shifted everything back. Um, we have continued to do um, studies about both uh, what we call the upper Church Street project, sort of the area of the old Bell, now 10 Church Street, we call it, um, as well as as well as the armory and trying to make sure we invest under, we're doing scenario planning for what is the best um, mixes and fit of the programmatic opportunities there. We know that um, both of those are high profile locations. Um, and we know that a renovated armory presents opportunities for adding better utilization and better, more space use within that building because of this current condition leaves so much of it unusable. So we are continuing to do um, programmatic studies um, of the armory and um, getting closer, I think, on um, what, what a proposed project solution for that project could be. And hopeful that um, we could be a capital request advanced so that it can be part of the 2024 request. Thank you, Regent Shu. Any follow-up? Uh, yeah, thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the other, I guess the other thing doesn't need to really be said, uh, which is a uh, disappointment that we um, d didn't have or don't have a bonding bill and um, doesn't look like we're going to have a bonding bill. So, um, but I will reiterate the fact that uh, you know, chemistry is extremely important um, for uh, the College of Science Engineering and other um, colleges as well now these days. And I, I hope we can get that going as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Shu. Uh, Regent Anderson. Uh, thank you, Chair McMillan. And uh, good to be here. Good to, good to be here again. Um, I guess my question is going to go to, uh, let's get him ready, Mr. Volna. Um, Back pre-COVID, the Debt Management Committee did a lot of studying on about uh, century bonds, and things look good, and I, I, I agree that it takes cash flow to pay debt, um, but with the things we have financed now, we should be like people that, uh, I agree, people that 
are lowering their mortgage with lower interest payments. We should be searching all we can. And I know Mr. Volna does that. I'm wondering, Mr. Volna, you know, when I chair the debt management, we looked at the uh, century bonds, they may have a place as we go forward. We hadn't made that decision. Do you still look at century bonds or has that changed in, uh, for capital projects going forward? Are we still anticipating maybe doing that someday? AVP Volna. Chair McMillan, <laughs> Regent Anderson, um, I, um, I'll, I'll give you uh, where we're at on that, uh, keeping in mind that we have a new senior vice president coming in, and I certainly do not want to uh, get out front of um, him, so to speak, in terms of his thoughts around that. Um, you are correct. We did do quite a bit of analysis on a century bond. Um, there was a flurry of activity in the markets around uh, schools issuing century bonds. Um, what we have seen is that that flurry has tapered off a little bit. We've also seen that um, although the interest rates that the Fed has been charging have dropped to near zero, the spreads have not followed quite as we had hoped. It is still a very attractive opportunity. And given the right board parameters around the use of it and uh, proper understanding of it, um, and uh, support from senior management. I think there could be a place for a century bond um, in our debt portfolio, but it is a pretty novel concept that I think would take some time for everybody to understand and get comfortable with. So I, I don't make any commitments at this point to whether or not it makes sense for us to say we're going to do it. Thank you, I, I appreciate that answer. And it, it is something that we probably need to investigate, but thank you, thank you. And uh, agree with you, Regent Anderson, and appreciate your ongoing service on the Debt Management Advisory Committee, where you get a firsthand uh, view of those matters. So, all right, we have uh, no other regents lined up to speak. I have a question. Uh, Regent uh, Simonson, I see a, yeah. a visual hand rising there. Go yeah. ahead. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate all the work that's been done and the details uh, on this, too, and certainly support the uh, priority projects. Just a uh, question, maybe I should know this, but I don't. On the university funding portion of this, how does that affect, is the percent of budget going forward? Is that a relatively flat thing, or are we looking at an increase in this segment? Is, a percent is that uh, Vice President uh, Bertelson or Volna on that one? Um, there it is, I see another yeah. hand up. Vice President Volna. Um, Chair McMillan, um, uh, what I would say is that, um, and Regent Simonson, what I would say is that um, the university's portion of the capital request is about 51.1 million. Given that we pay off between 80 and $90 million a year already of existing debt, the net impact to our uh, debt burden and our debt capacity will be virtually flat. So uh, I do not see a problem with this in terms of the um, overall impact to the university budget or frankly to the ratings. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. All right. Uh, this item, again, as I noted at the outset, is a review item. We will act on it at our October meeting. And uh, that uh, let's move on then. But before we do move on to the biennial budget request, I uh, think I noted that uh, student representative uh, Sia Buttar has joined us. I hope I'm saying your name right, Sia. Why don't you introduce yourself and uh, now that we've got you online and uh, welcome to the Finance and Operations Committee. Thank you so much, Chair McMillan. Um, so yes, my name is Sia Buttar. I just graduated this past May from the School of Public Health. I got my master's in public health in administration and policy. And I'm currently a first year in medical school that's why I apologize for the scrubs. I'm in and out of anatomy lab today. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in healthcare administration as well as health financing. So I'm very excited for the opportunity to join and join the Board of Regents and represent the professional students and specifically join this committee. So thank you for this opportunity. Well, thank you for your commitment throughout that kind of a, of a rigorous schooling. And I think you chose a obviously an uh, impactful field with public health and equally impactful with the uh, medical degree. So good luck in that. And thanks for uh, finding time for uh, the governance process as well. 
All right, then uh, on to the, the third item of business today. Again, a review today, action in October of the president's recommended fiscal year 2022-2023 biennial budget request to the state of Minnesota. President Gable and Interim Senior Vice President Thonison will take us through this item and uh, I'll look to our president to start us off again. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair Beeson, members of the committee. As a result of COVID-19, we recognize that the state faces a very difficult challenge in aligning decreasing revenues with increasing costs. But we maintain that state investment in the university should remain a priority. Over the course of this pandemic, the work of university students, faculty, and staff this year, from vaccine and therapeutic development and increasing testing capacity by the medical school to extensions work on rural mental health to the College of Science and Engineering inventing low-cost ventilators, to the pandemic modeling from the School of Public Health and beyond proves that the value created for all Minnesotans has never been higher. In response to the state's financial challenges, our proposed biennial budget request is focused on maintaining the university's strengths while aligning work with aspects of our new Impact 2025 system-wide strategic plan on things that are important to both the university and the state of Minnesota. Each year, the university faces cost increases related to growth and services to support the needs of students, increased programming as a result of increased research activity and inflation, particularly in areas such as healthcare, lab supplies, equipment, library materials, and facilities costs. In addition, after over a year of widespread salary reductions for many faculty and staff, and a strategic investment in an appropriate merit-based salary increase is necessary in order to maintain the quality of our workforce. Julie Tomlinson, Interim Senior Vice President for Finance and Operations is here to discuss the details of our recommended 2022-2023 biennial budget request in more deal, detail. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, President Gable and uh, Interim Senior Vice President Tonneson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, the recommended request we bring before you today builds on the priorities that President Gable just discussed and reflects a strategy that has the university's mission and vision as its foundation. It calls on the state to recognize its opportunity to share in the success of the institution through enhancing our ability to deliver on the goals of the system-wide strategic plan and by recognizing what it takes to maintain quality and preserve the unique experiences that we offer our students. It also reflects a strategy that we believe is fiscally responsible during this time of extreme financial uncertainty, and it strives to be simple and straightforward as well as compelling. Next slide, please. To provide some context for the request, we wanted to again ground the committee in some of the, the logistics and the basic information about the appropriation and the request process. The timeline for the request is the same as it has been in the past biennium. This summer, we started to receive budget process instructions from the state. In fact, just this week, we received their direction in terms of submitting change requests, which is what we're discussing today. We also began to develop different cost and revenue estimates for our overall budget under different scenarios so that we could understand how the state appropriation would support and complement those different models. That process led to the specific recommendations we are bringing before you today. When this request is finalized in October, we will submit it to the state. Their deadline, as indicated in the instructions, is October 15. That is why it is before you today for review and action then in October. We anticipate meetings with Minnesota Management and Budget in the governor's office, resulting in his recommendations being released sometime in December. And then the legislative process begins culminating in what we hope will be a final higher education appropriate <coughs> bill signed by the governor by the middle to the end of May. Of course, these are plans. This is based on what's happened in the past. They can change, but this is the best information we have as of today. Whatever the appropriation ends up being in the end, we will build it into the annual budget before you for review and action in June. Slide, please. For the basics on the appropriation itself, Above the blue line, you see what's, what's called, what we call the O&M appropriation or the operations and maintenance appropriation. That's the large unrestricted block grant we get from the state of Minnesota and those dollar amounts are for the current biennium. 
Between the blue lines, you see the state specials as they are in law, again, for this biennium. The state budget process operates on an incremental basis. So they start with a base appropriation amount and make decisions to increase or decrease from that base. So our general fund base to begin the numbers conversation is roughly 1.3 billion for the biennium, which is the recurring appropriation for FY21 carried into the next biennium, so times two for two years. The non-general fund appropriations identify <coughs> below the blue line, those two in particular, we also consider part of our base in that they are recurring appropriations for operations. We are technically asking for a continuation of that base as well as we enter the process. Those numbers have not changed for about 15 years or more. Uh, slide, please. I thought it might also be useful to see some history on what has actually occurred since the mid 90s related to our requests and what we actually have received in appropriation changes. As you can see, we have consistently requested base increases over 5%, sometimes well over 5%, uh, until the proposal we are bringing before you today, which you will see shortly is at 3.5%. The changes in appropriation themselves have not been as stable. Across this time frame, we have received base reductions in three biennia, even though we asked for an increase even in those challenging years. Two of those decreases were 15%. Our average request, excluding the proposal before you today, has been just over 12%. And in the biennia with an increase, so excluding those where we dropped, the average has been 8.6%. And that has slowed down over the last eight years a lot, or the last four biennia to an average increase of just under 5%. And one last history slide, if you'll advance, please, that you have seen in various forms before is the steady reduction in the higher education appropriations as a percent of the total state general fund spending. Going back to the nice round number year of 1990, the appropriations to higher education were 14.5% of the state's general fund spending, with us and Minnesota State each receiving just over 6.5%. I didn't plot the Office of Higher Education or the state grant program. They are relatively small, but those are the two other pieces in the total higher education appropriation. Across the years, the two systems have trended down together, as you can see by the line. So that for the current year, Minnesota State receives just over 3% of the state's general fund spending, and we receive just under 3%. The total for higher education now sits at about 7%. Not a surprise to any of us, it has been difficult to maintain, let alone increase the state's support of higher education. And this has been happening across the country. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Uh, slide, please. What we are bringing for you before you today is essentially one item, a request to not only maintain our base appropriation, but to provide an increment above that base of 15.5 million in FY22 and an additional 15.5 million in FY23. In what we call biennial math, that is a $46.5 million increase. Biennial math compares one two-year period to the prior two-year period. So you have to take the first year's increase that will occur twice in the next two years. You have to take that times two and then add the second year increment because it will only occur once in the next biennium. When you do that, that 46.5 million represents a 3.5% increase above that total biennial or two year base appropriation. Our goal was to remain simple, straightforward, and honest and determine an amount that will help us maintain the quality of our programs while recognizing the financial challenges the state must address. We believe this request is responsible in that context. Uh, slide, please. We are all hoping that life settles down a bit from what we've experienced in the past six months or so. Uh, but we also know that the higher education environment is one of constant change and renewal. In order to stay in place, we will need to address the cost pressures you see identified on this slide. These are not new. They are core to our operations and will not go away during the pandemic or in the post-pandemic world. Compensation for our talented uh, people, compliance requirements, facility upkeep, the basic infrastructure to remain competitive for external grants, those are important every year. 
and they are all intertwined around the very real need to give attention to existing program areas throughout the state in order to remain vibrant for our students and the state and even the globe. For the next two years, we also want to emphasize that throughout our budget, we will be focusing on highlighting the links between resource allocation and the goals and priorities of the system-wide strategic plan. Uh, advance the slide, please. Specific to the biennial request, we are proposing that if the appropriation increases are approved, we will focus some of those new resources specifically on the mentor sections commitment of the system-wide strategic plan and the three goals approved under that heading. We believe these three areas, driving innovation for next generation health, building a fully sustainable future and advancing natural resources and agro-food systems are three areas with direct connections between university strengths and opportunities and the needs of the state. Our experts are working on detailed action plans under each of these uh, to achieve the goals and you can find a summary of their early planning ideas in the docket item summary on page 55 of your materials. But we are excited about the opportunity to make that connection between state support and advancement of these initiatives. Slide, please. It is too early in the budget process uh, for a great deal of specificity in cost estimates, but we feel confident in some very high level projections for the next biennium. The numbers you see here under budget challenge are the result of some early modeling for different salary and fringe cost assumptions facility cost increases primarily for utilities and debt, technology maintenance agreements, and then some general pools for program investment, including the mentor sections initiatives I just mentioned. Our early planning on how to address those costs involves the requested state appropriation increase that you see here at $15.5 million. That would be roughly 28% of the challenge as we've defined it uh, early on here. But the majority of the challenge, so 72% in this case, would be coming from the combination of continued internal budget cuts or reallocations, potential limited growth in some of our other revenue sources, and potentially thoughtful and strategic increases in tuition rates and our targeted growth in enrollment, which would generate incremental revenues. There is no planned definite assumption on tuition rate increases as part of the request. Uh, slide, please. In closing, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, we feel that this request is responsible and responsive uh, to the needs of the states in that it, it not only provides an opportunity to address specific programmatic areas of importance to those of the state, but maybe more importantly, it recognizes the critical partnership with the state in enhancing the core strength of the university so we can continue to serve our students with an excellent education and we can continue to make discoveries that, as the slide says, fuels the state's economy and improves our quality of life. Uh, and with that, Mr. Chair, I will stop and invite the committee's thoughts and discussion. Very good. Thank you, Interim Senior Vice President Tonneson. And uh, let's see, comments or questions at this point? Again, the raised hands feature of the, of the uh, the internet works best there. I see, uh, thought I saw Regent Powell's hand up. We'll start with him. And then I see Regent Shu has his raised hand feature used. Go ahead, uh, Regent Powell. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, uh, Chair McMillan. Um, I think this president is for interim Vice President Tonneson or President Gable. But in the very, uh, this very last slide where we talked about um, the state contribution at 28% and then the university uh, at a little over 70%, um, and that divided between reallocations, um, uh, new revenue, and tuition. Um, please, would you give us a little more um, uh, guidance on uh, your thinking there, and how you, you know, how you would approach um, within each of those three um, buckets of, of revenue? Uh, Which Gale, of you? Uh, Wants to take a swing at that, Vice President Tonneson. Sure, I'm happy to do that. And then President Gable, if you uh, want to join in, please do so. Uh, this is part of our regular annual budget process that you will actually be a part of uh, starting in 
December this year and again in February and then in May, we will be discussing the budget for 22 and then also the implications for 23. And as part of that process, every year we take a look at what our opportunities are. So we're going to be looking for opportunities to leverage other revenues. That is our first priority. I'm not sure how that's gonna go this year given the impacts to our operations that the pandemic has um, really resulted in. But we're, that's our opportunity to look for growth in other revenues. That would be indirect cost recovery revenues, sales revenues, other things that can support uh, some of these activities. And as that progresses, as we create estimates with the units on that, we'll also be then looking for uh, what do we want to do with tuition as we do every year. It's a conversation about trying to balance the needs of the university with the goals of holding tuition down for students. And again, the impact of the pandemic uh, may cause us to go one way or another on that. We can model literally uh, anything uh, that, that we want to in that regard, and we will continue to do that. And then of course, on the reallocation side, it, is, it then becomes, as we move through the process, a decision of how much can we force in terms of internal budget cuts on our units in a strategic way that, uh, again, helps us try to keep everybody as successful as possible. So how far can we push that and where, how does that line up with the cost increases that we know or are choosing to make? So we can also make different choices on the cost side um, that you see here related to compensation and to investment pools. So it's really, I wish I had a, you know, a definite, it's this amount, this amount, and this amount, but in, the, in that point where we're at in the process, we just don't have that. We have to work through each one of those components um, in combination and how they work together uh, as, we, as we go forward. Uh, President Gable, did you wanna add anything to that? Uh, no, just that I agree. Okay. All right. Any follow-up, uh, Regent Powell? Uh, I, I don't, uh, Chair McMillan. I think that that um, gives a good context for how it'll be approached and a good reminder. And I think we uh, can all see that, you know, it'll be very challenging. Indeed. Uh, Regent Shu, and then we have uh, Regent Rosha next. Uh, thank you, Chair McMillan. Thank you, um, uh, Interim Senior Vice President for Finance and Operations, Tonson. I, I, had, I guess I had not known that uh, 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 Senior Vice President Burnett has exited the room already. Um, so I am a little bit interested in whether or not the uh, replacement um, uh, new CFO has any input into this particular presentation or um, is he not starting um, even looking at this stuff yet. And so that, that's my first question. President Gable, I guess I'd turn to you in response to Regent Shu's question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Regent Shu, um, upon approval uh, by the board, um, the Senior Vice President and CFO, Myron Franz, would start work on September 30th. He is onboarding in the meantime. Julie is serving as the interim Senior Vice President um, although she's consulting, but uh, the plan is being, the plan has to continue to move forward for your review so that we can get it to the state by the deadline. And so um, we bring it forward under her leadership as the interim senior vice president. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, so I guess uh, the only question I would have right now is, um, well, I'll make a statement first. I think, uh, I think we should be asking for more money. And um, at, at a, as a good start, um, how much more would it take for us to reach parity uh, with Minsky? We haven't been at parity for years, and I think we're a couple hundred million dollars behind since 2015. Um, so I was just wondering what that number would be today if we were to um, try and achieve parity next session. Interim SVP Tonneson. You happen uh, to have that uh, parity number at hand? I think it's uh, showing on your chart, but not called uh, out. Uh, Mr. Chair, Regent Shu, I don't have that uh, right 
and, and I'm trying to think through all my spreadsheets really fast to see if I could pull it up. Uh, I may try to do that during the meeting, but if not, I will get you an answer shortly after the meeting. I just don't have their specifics right at handy today. <laughs> so I apologize for that. Any Thank other follow-up, Regent Chu? No, I just think we should uh, get get try to reach parity uh, in, in the next biennium. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just just a couple of real quick comments. First, I think that it's uh, it's sound um, to operate under the assumption of, of uh, no additional uh, tuition increase. Um, you know, I guess theoretically there's a possibility that that uh, an increase. Um, would be necessary or warranted, uh, but at the same time, I think it's uh, reasonable that we may be looking at uh, uh, making an adjustment downward based on what we're able to provide an offer um, to students and, you know, sort of what the world looks like here in the coming months. Um, the second comment that I will, you know, that I'll make um, is that, you know, we've really got to be thoughtful about how we present ourselves to the legislature. Um, you know, so often the university, you know, we kind of sit back and and we're critical of the legislature for um, for the, the the amount of support that the university receives, but you know, really, it's you know, I, I think we start with our own house first. And and uh, uh, when you consider the fact that they are going to have many many uh, entities that will rely on the state for their very survival, you can imagine it's a you know when when you're often perceived as the 800 pound gorilla uh, with with you know massive resources as the university is perceived by many, um, it, you know, it, it's going to make our our argument that much more difficult. And so I would just make the appeal that um, if we're going to be successful in, in you know, it, it, again, hopefully as Regent Shu points out, re restoring the parity that we had long enjoyed uh, with our sister system in the state, um, we need to be without uh, flaw. We need to work as hard as we can to demonstrate to the state that we are excellent stewards of money and that we do need it. And if, if we take actions and do things that reflect that um, resources are not a problem for us, um, they're going to see our actions as more compelling than our words uh, when we are, again, competing with um, a lot of entities that are near and dear to many legislative districts, many legislators themselves, um, and, and they're going to be needing these funds for uh, just, just to keep the doors open. Um, so for us to, to, to make this case, we have to really be um, on our very best for ensuring that we're, we're good stewards. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Regent Rocha. I think I've got uh, Regent Simonson and uh, I don't think we have anyone else teed up, do we, Mr. Langworthy? All right, Regent Simonson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you uh, for present, presenting this. Um, I'm really interested in the, uh, when we talk about fully sustainable future <clears throat> and all alternative sources of revenue, I've mentioned that many times. And so I'm really looking forward to Dr. Kramer's strategic plan. He verbally talked about uh, return on uh, uh, licensing technology and intellectual property of more than doubling the annual income over a period of time. So I'm really looking forward to that. And one question I have or comment that uh, I was in some conversations this week with some people, including a faculty member, uh, <coughs> virtualization. We're talking about that. And one of the comments came up, there are people in leadership administration that feel that commercialization is not consistent with our mission statement. I think it should be. I think we should put language in there to, uh, to state that and encourage that. Uh, I, I see it totally for a number of reasons consistent with our mission statement. So that's basically my comment. Anybody wanna respond to that? Uh, President Gable, did you uh, want to take a response there? Uh, I'd have to take a look specifically at the misalignment. Um, in theory, I totally agree um, and have advanced commercialization in the strategic plan, as, as we know. So um, I think that um, an overall look at the mission statement is probably due now that we have the strategic plan, and I don't see why we wouldn't have this be uh, under part of that review as well. Thank you. All right, you. this uh, item again, as the last one is before us for review today, action in October. So uh, we have another opportunity as we dig deeper into the materials to uh, work with the president's team and come back in October and prepare to uh, 
take a vote and put something in front of the uh, the governor and the legislature ultimately. At this point, I have a, uh, a recess built in, but I think given the uh, scope of the next topic, I want to keep plowing ahead. We're doing well on time and we've still got some weighty matters. So assuming our HR team is here and, uh, and ready to go, I'm going to keep going and then we'll see if we need a break after uh, we hear from, uh, from uh, Vice President Horseman and, uh, and his team. But uh, the next item, item four, is, and I, I referenced this at the beginning of the meeting, um, we're going to hear from President Gable, Interim Vice President Horseman, Assistant Vice President Coulson, Senior Director Kuchera, and uh, Director Klein, and build on, importantly, a June discussion we had on workforce and total compensation metrics, and uh, really focus today's conversation on one of the most important things that, uh, that our senior team's been working on, and that is growing and sophisticating our HR analytics capabilities, and in doing so, highlighting practical and applied ways that information can be used to inform future decisions. This discussion also helps us inform our future HR conversations. And uh, as, uh, as Vice Chair Beeson and I noted, um, that's a big part of the priority in this year's work plan. So with that, I'm gonna invite uh, President Gable to lead off and, uh, and get us started. Thank you, Chair McMillan, Vice Chair Beeson, members of the committee. As you'll recall, two years ago, the university began a system-wide effort to harness and analyze the vast amounts of information stored in its data systems with an emphasis on the human resources components of that data. As we make data entry consistent across systems and make that data available in customizable, easy to read reports for all leaders and managers, the university is creating powerful tools to analyze workforce composition, spot trends, and plan for the future. To date, HR Analytics has created 28 customizable preset reports or dashboards, and then one ad hoc dashboard for creating unique individualized reports. The reports can analyze human resources data system-wide or by campus, unit, or department, and many more reports are planned. The value of this HR data will continue to increase as the university advances from reporting on past or current status and begin using the information to model and predict the future in order to plan strategically, particularly around equity as outlined in the strategic plan. Members of the committee, building on the discussion at the June meeting around the university's developments in human resource analytics today, you'll hear examples of how these analytics can be used to help a system campus examine its finances and adjust staffing levels aligned to revenues, and to help a college's leaders realize that a large portion of their faculty may be nearing retirement and that they need to plan accordingly. Joining us with these examples and others are Interim Vice President for Human Resources, Ken Horseman, Link Coulson, Assistant Vice President for Institutional Analysis, Amy Cusera, Senior Director in the Office of Human Resources, and Phil Klein, Director in the Office of Human Resources. And at this time, I would like to turn it over to that team for their presentation, Mr. Chair. Thank you, President Gable. And it's uh, over to you then, Interim Vice President Horseman. Uh, thank you, President Gable, for that summary. And thank you, Assistant VP uh, Coulson, for joining us today for the discussion after the presentation. Chair McMillan, Vice Chair Beeson, Interim Senior Vice President Tonneson Regents and student representatives, as President Gable stated, significant work has been done with human resource data the last two years. And this has resulted in dashboards that provide data in a framework that can be used to inform decision-making. In short, we can customize reporting now that shows us where we have been and where we are today. The future of data capability is in analytics, however, supported by artificial intelligence, machine learning, and allowing us to do predictive modeling. That is the potential to use intelligent data to anticipate future trends in our workforce, allowing the university to inform its strategic plan and the ever growing critical need to manage its human resources. Analytics will be a valuable asset, in fact, to support the, the uh, objectives of MPAC 2025. And for example, commitment four, allowing the university to foster a welcoming community, 
that values belonging, equity, diversity, and dignity in people and ideas. Principles that allow us to retain a highly competitive workforce. I will now ask OHR Senior Director of HR Operations, Amy Kachara, and Phil Klein, our Director of Workforce Data Management, to take us through today's presentation. Next slide, please. Thank you, IVP Horseman, President Gable, Chair McMillan, Vice Chair Beeson, and members of the committee. We're, we are excited today to have this opportunity to share with you our work on HR data analytics. The partnership between the Office of Information Technology, Enterprise Data Management and Reporting, the Office of Human Resources, as well as campus and college human resources staff over the past two years has produced a new reporting environment which has been adopted and used across the enterprise. This environment required a higher level of data consistency across the system and at every level of the organization. This allowed the development of dashboards which provide self-service data access for leaders and local HR staff, which replaces the manual approach to compiling usable data reports of the past. Right now, the university has 28 HR dashboards with more currently being developed. In fact, we will be releasing two more dashboards on Monday, bringing our total to 30. The work thus far provides a strong foundation for our next steps in HR analytics to help solve the university's business challenges by moving from reporting to analysis and beyond. Next slide, please. The university is now poised to further leverage analytics and workforce planning as our capabilities are enhanced. Solving critical business problems at the university can be supported using these tools and techniques. This requires a move forward in both our technology and reporting, as well as a transition in our thinking about the university's enterprise HR function. It also requires us to develop a new expectation of university leaders to make data-driven business decisions given their access to these dashboards. I will now turn it over to Director Klein, who will walk you through two examples of how this data can be used to support relevant business challenges at the university today. Thank you, Senior Director Kuchera, Chair McMillan, and fellow regents. Here's our first example. These reporting tools that we use in this example are in place in HR analytics today. We're using the example of revenue challenges in a system campus. The question is, how can we adjust our staffing levels to bring employee costs in line with revenue expectations? So we start with the who and what. First, we would need to understand what the workforce is. We can use the dashboard employee headcount by workforce category and drill down to the system campus employee population. Next slide, please. Next, we need to know the compensation costs for that same population. We can use the institutional based salary and non-institutional based salary dashboards to gather this information. Cross-referencing these three data sources allows campus, unit, or HR leaders to understand where the talent shifts need to occur and what the compensation impacts of those shifts would be. Leaders can then use these data to identify workforce strategies that would meet the original business goal. Next slide, please. In this second example, we start with this question. With a large portion of a unit's faculty nearing retirement age, how can we ensure our faculty staffing will meet the projected need in the next five to 10 years? Again, we start with the who and what. First, we use the data to understand what the age of the workforce is in the unit by employment group. Here we use the dashboard employee headcount demographics. Next, we recently completed a machine learning proof of concept in partnership with the Carl Carlson Analytics Lab at the Carlson School of Management. As a result, we created a new report that can actually provide a forecasted <coughs> schedule of departures, the predicted employees dashboard, or I'm sorry, the predicting employee departures dashboard. Next slide, please. Knowing this information, we could use this upcoming retirement transition to help retain a diverse workforce that mirrors our student base using the equal opportunity, equal employment opportunity goal setting tool. Last, using planned recruiting analytics tools, which are currently being considered for prioritization, we can guide the search for the diverse and engaged faculty members to advance the college in its mission. 
We hope these two examples help to illustrate how HR analytics can help the university make data-driven decisions to meet critical goals. Now I will turn it over to Senior Director Kuchera to finish the presentation. Thank you, Director Klein. HR analytics are based on a foundational partnership with Enterprise Data Management and Reporting, the Office of Information Technology and HR across all campuses, colleges, and units, which have been developed over the past two years. Today, we have solid data on employees, positions, compensation, and demographics, which allows us to provide this enhanced reporting. This has been achieved in partnership with campus, college, and unit HR professionals who support consistent data entry and leverage data in decision-making. Additionally, Edmer provides a governance structure and cross-pillar partnerships. OIT provides the technical resources and infrastructure for HR data, and OHR leads the HR analytics efforts and brings a perspective that focuses on system-wide people needs and resources. With that, I will open it up for any questions you may have for us today. All right, uh, thank you team. And uh, I'm guessing there's some interest here, but we'll give Regents a minute to, uh, to uh, grab their, raise their hands if they. Regent Shu, you get to start. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, presenters. Um, my question is, uh, I mean, I think it's great that we, we have these dashboards now. Um, are these actually going to be um, tied to our PeopleSoft system? Or, I mean, I don't know what systems we're tying to to the back end, but um, it'll be very interesting to start getting some uh, information about um, um, people and um, their backgrounds and, and that type of thing. But uh, we used to use a term called field shaping researchers, and uh, that was uh, kind of, uh, uh, I don't know if it's phasing out or if it has phased out already. I haven't heard the term for a while, but I'm just wondering, we didn't seem to be able to track who was a field shaping researcher back back uh, a couple of years ago. And I'm wondering, what are we, what are we doing to um, actually capture, um, like, new subjective data like that. IVP Horseman, we'll start with you and see if uh, you've got an answer there. Or you want to, you want to. Yeah. I, uh, thank you, Chair McMillan, Regent Shu. I can start off and then I will uh, turn it over to <clears throat> to talk a little bit more about the interconnection between PeopleSoft and the uh, dashboard development. Um, we currently are able uh, with the dashboards to determine uh, as uh, Senior Director Kachera and Director Klein alluded to uh, what positions employees are in. So we can in fact determine how many employees we have in direct research or mission support. Uh, the future of this tool will allow us to define that more subjectively and to look at demographics and uh, you know, from a retention standpoint as well. So the, the short answer is this will get us closer to answering that question on field shaping researchers. Right now, it would probably be more of a manual survey of the departments we have, but this work can help us inform that. And with that, I'll turn it over to Director Klein uh, to continue the answer. Director Klein. Thank you, Chair McMillan. Thank you, Regent Chu, for your question. I would say that we have the ability to pull any information that exists in our core operational systems into this environment, and we will work towards that depending on what's prioritized. Uh, as we start to think about how we want to identify folks in those core operational systems, that then translates into our analytics environment. I don't know if that answers your question. I hope it does. Regent Hsu, follow-up? Yeah, th thank you very much for that answer. Uh, basically, you're telling me uh, that we have not been tracking it, and we aren't tracking it today, and um, we can only pull data, obviously, from things that we've been tracking and, and recording over the years. And um, so I guess my, my theory has always been that we, we weren't really tracking that, but you're kind of confirming that. Is that right? 
correct or client? We are not tracking that in our PeopleSoft system today. No, I'm, I'm not familiar with the term, so it's new to me. Okay, so it, Mr. Chair, um, just a quick follow-up. Yes, go ahead, Regent so Are we still using the term or are we phasing it out? Let's see, uh, IVP Horseman. Thank you, Chair McMillan, Regent Shu. Um, if there is a, a uh, agreed upon definition of field shaping researcher, and I might actually call upon, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, out of line, either Provost Croson or perhaps uh, Assistant Vice President Carlson to, to speak to that, uh, we certainly can track it. Um, my question would be, is that a set definition that we use? I saw uh, <clears throat> senior vice I actually uh, see some... a uh, help from the financial community coming Yeah, I saw and, a uh, hand raised there, so perhaps yes, uh, by Julie uh, in the discussion. Um, vice President Tonneson. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, I the only thing I would add to this part of the conversation is, and maybe just because I've been around for a while, uh, that term I remember also, uh, Regent Shu, and it was in my memory related to describing initiatives of the university. If it was part of the biennial request or part of our budget, it was a term that we used um, in planning for and describing how we wanted to advance part of the mission. <clears throat> and so I don't think we have ever in that time or today called that a, actually coded people with that particular title in our systems. It was more about using it as a descriptor. Um, and if anyone else has a different memory, please chime in, but that is how I remember the use of that term. Thank you, Vice President Tonneson. And my own recollection is similar that as we unveiled the grand challenges plan for, for this campus, one of the parts of that was to find, retain, and, uh, and encourage researchers who would be considered field shaping. But I uh, appreciate your inquiry down this line, Regent Shu, and, uh, and uh, obviously there's a subjective element of uh, who is field shaping and who isn't. But anyway, you've uh, struck a chord here. Do you have any other follow-up before I move on? I got a bunch of regents interested here now. No, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. So uh, next up, we have Regent Beeson and then Representative Butar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, colleagues, and uh, thank you, Interim Vice President Horseman and the directors for the presentation. This is um, really, really important. Um, it is built on the foundational work that's been done by, uh, by the folks in HR, including former Vice President Brown. Um, it really came out of this whole um, story about administrative bloat in the Wall Street Journal article. This goes back almost my whole tenure now in the regents and getting to a point now where we, we um, have produced uh, models and um, uh, introduced in this culture of data-driven decision-making on the business side, uh, I think is momentous. Um, it does belong in the HR area. It's gonna be used university-wide, but somebody has to own it uh, and um, 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 have the information um, coordinated and, and so this is the right uh, this is the right home um, uh, uh, for this the there's a lot of ways that's I mean I'm pleased that's already being used to me the most effective way to drive this into the culture is to make sure that the senior leaders use it both in terms of implementing the strategic plan but also an annual work plan so when the president lays out the work plan for her cabinet, there needs to be references to this, to the analytics and citing analytics and goals, using the data and creating goals out of uh, the work uh, for the year is a very effective way because that will then water fall it down to the rest of the organization. So using these is, 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 is really critical. And, you know, um, when we talk about data driven analytics and decision making, it's, that, that can frighten people, but I would contend that this is, data is what our faculty use and it's what our researchers use. It's using, it's using information to drive decision-making. We're just doing this more formally on the business side where we've done it all the time on the scholarship, 
with our faculty, as well as with the research work uh, that we conduct. So it's really the same approach, using information to make decisions. Not every decision is going to be made based on bottom line cost, you know, of dollars saved. We know we've had this discussion. We're not going to whack programs because they're not making money, but we do need to know by program and by department, revenue and expense, and having that available so that we can make informed decisions. I'm very excited about this. It's the beginning. The board needs to keep us this presentation and um, ask the, the department to come back with even a more sort of developed use of the, um, of the model and the plan for sort of expanding the model and focusing on how how the model shows up in these work plans is sort of the, the next generation that I see. But thanks very much for um, uh, the presentation. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Beeson. I happen to echo your sentiments and thoughts and appreciate the way you've articulated them. I think I'd give, uh, give President Gable an opportunity at this point perhaps to respond, even though you didn't have a question there, but you said quite a bit. So President Gable. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Regent Beeson, and, and members of the committee. Um, I, I also agree very much with what uh, Regent Beeson has said and with thanks because this is a, a long view to shift the thinking and then to do the work necessary in order to support the decision making in this way. It's a lot of um, very clear and, and high quality effort has brought us to this point. Uh, the reason I wanted to chime in is because I wanted to emphasize that this is just the beginning, that this is something that needs to happen in a broad sense across many of our functions, HR being a very logical place to start given the percentage of the budget and the importance of our human capital and, and making the very best decisions we possibly can, since that is our distinction is in our people. Um, but the, the lessons learned and the strengths that we're building um, have broad impact and, and the need to do this in the way in which we are likely to do it is captured in our commitments in the strategic plan. Very good. Thank you. Uh, I've got uh, Representative Buttar and then I've got, uh, let's see, Regent Powell. So Representative Buttar, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair McMillan. Um, <laughs> thank you, Chair McMillan, VP Horseman, and directors. Um, Director Klein, you were discussing how dashboards and predictive analytics can help understand where talent shifts need to occur. And I was wondering if you could expand on the balance kind of between goals of efficiency and ensuring that the hiring process is fair and equitable, specifically in regards to diversity. So specifically, if you could get, if we could get some more information on that equal employment opportunity goal setting tool, I believe you mentioned. So perhaps some of the metrics that are used and how nuances and humanity are taken into account with that. Director Klein, you want to uh, respond? Thank you, Chair McMillan, and thank you, Representative Buttar, for the question. Uh, I can certainly speak a bit about that EEO goal setting tool. Uh, specifically, the university is required to uh, meet by law um, some equity and diversity goals. And what this tool does is it takes information from the global market, uh, imports that into the tool, and then uses that information to look at where the university is in regards to the market and helps us to understand where we have what I'll call catch up to do, or perhaps where we're ahead of the curve on those uh, diversity goals. What we, what we do with that and how we use that is up to our leadership. The, the tools themselves provide the information. The information, once it's readily available to our leaders, should help them to drive towards meeting those diversity goals. Uh, so, Really, once again, everything that we do in analytics is providing information to our leaders, and then it requires our leaders to leverage that information to right, make the right decisions. The analytics that we provide or the uh, even the machine learning capabilities are only there to provide our leaders who make the right decisions with the information they need to make those decisions. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh... Regent Powell, and then I see Regent Swigum, and that's uh, that, that's the end of the list. So, Regent Powell. Uh, Chair McMillan, my question was very well put by Regent Beeson, and so I will pass. Very good. Regent Swigum. 
Mr. Chairman, thank you. I think my question would be of Director Klein, I believe. And if you could put up chart 80 or page 80 of the report. Director Klein, I think my question is kind of a follow-up to Representative Buttar. And I appreciate all the information. I think it's very useful. The data is very, very useful. It's important for us to meet all our goals of performance and diversity. But as I look at the example on page 80, I see these, what I would call silos or quotas. Maybe it's just spots to be filled. And I'm hoping that while we fill these silos, as we fill these categories, that we're also able to balance performance and talent that individuals bring to the job. That we just don't use the analytics to just fill a silo or to fill a quota. That just doesn't strike me right. It just doesn't strike as it's just or it's the American way. Can you help me as to we balance filling these columns, these categories or these silos with the performance and the capabilities and the talent that individuals bring to the job too? I think they're mutually inclusive, by the way. I don't think they have to be exclusive of each other. But I do want to make sure that we're, you know, as we fill these silos, that the university is building the system here that we need for performance as well. Thank you, Regent Swiggum. Director Klein. Thank you, Chair McMillan. Thank you, Regent Swiggum, for the question. I absolutely echo your sentiment there. What we're trying to do here is show that these are data sources that can inform the right decisions. And if we take all of the data sources and inform the leaders who are making those decisions, we're dependent on the leaders to make those decisions based on all of these other factors that might weigh into that. I will go on a little bit outside of the presentation and share with you that our hope is that we can move into a place where we can do recruiting next. This is our workforce that we have today that exists in our analytics data source. We're hoping to move into recruiting and that if we do some analytics and recruiting, it will help to identify for us some attributes based on the data and the actual analytics that will help us to find the right people based on things that we might miss. But once again, in addition, I would say that all of those predictive analytics will be presented to leadership and leadership or people who are in the process are the ones who are going to be making the final decisions. We're not suggesting that this analytics will automatically fill a box, if you would, but rather that it's going to inform our leaders to be able to make the right decisions with all of the data in front of them. I hope that answers your question, Regent Spigen. If not, please let me know. Director Klein, I appreciate your response. It does answer my question. And there's a balance there that has to be of mutual inclusivity. And I believe that that can take place. I like the focus towards recruitment that you're talking about. IVP Horstman, do I see a hand up there? Yes, thank you, Chair McMillan, Regent Spigen. Thank you, Director Klein, for that complete answer. I just wanted to add, you know, the interconnection between different efforts we have in place today will come together. We spoke briefly in the past about performance management, and there is an effort in our office to offer a common platform in that regard, which will be entered into a common system. And in theory, we hope in FY21, 60% of our university population will be using that program. That could be part of our analytics pool to inform performance going forward. And, you know, we recently completed with the Carlson School a machine learning project with two teams. 
And many of us have spent a lot of our years looking at analytics and when we saw the results, we, you couldn't contain the excitement in the Zoom world. I mean, it, uh, the idea of being able to predict turnover in an organization like this as you manage workforce is incredibly important. And the tools we developed in there gave us the promise of, of you know, being able to attain that in the future. So we are very excited about bringing all these different uh, metrics together to inform and uh, provide a new version of data that is really a living um, part of our decision-making process for all leaders. Um, so thank you very much. All right, uh, good discussion, good material with uh, promising and uh, you know promising out things to look for and uh, certainly high expectations uh, from leadership and the board about how we're going to deploy all this. I also know we have our analytic guru here, but uh, we don't have any questions for him, but typically we're, we're peppering uh, Link Coulson with uh, questions about fiscal analytics and glad to see you in the mix here too. And I'm sure we'll, uh, we'll hear from you in the future, but I'm going to now uh, uh, call a 10 minute recess of the uh, committee and uh, we will resume. It is 1110. So we'll, uh, we'll be back in at 1120.
And then they had a double header in St. Louis. You know what? They got beat. I mean, they had that. And then they had two days off. They had that on. Okay. Go ahead and start. Who's that? We're only a game ahead. Okay. Everyone assembled really in real time here and virtually. We're ready to resume the meeting of the Finance and Operations Committee. Thank you for being back in a timely manner. And we move to item five on our agenda, which is a resolution related to an extension of the dining services contract on the Twin Cities campus. This is a review item as well. And I believe Vice President Bertelsen and Director Karen are going to walk us through the rationale for this. And then we'll have board questions. Vice President Bertelsen, are you teed up and ready to go? You look like it. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Regents. This will be a very short presentation. You probably did a little bit of history. If you can move to the next slide, please. Prior to 1998, on the Twin Cities campus, we operated our own food services. In 98, we awarded the food service management contract to a private vendor. And just for a reminder, the frontline staff, our teams are represented there, continue to be university staff. In 2008, we issued a new RFP and issued this management contract with multiple extensions. Now we are working on a new RFP as well as a business analysis to consider self-management again. Next slide, please. Last October, you approved an extension of the existing food service management contract for up to two years. This was shorter than the existing four-year option extension that we had available to us. But that was a choice for the Twin Cities campus to use that time to fully work through an RFP process. This represents the timeline and process that we presented to you then last October. Next slide, please. This slide shows the proposed revised timeline and process. The requested extension before you now would be instead of up to two years, it would be up to three years and provides us both more time to prepare the RFP and gather campus feedback, which is really due to the challenges of our COVID times and a bit more time for any transition to a new plan at the back end. Next slide, please. This is the resolution. And with that, we welcome questions. Thank you, Vice President Bertelsen. So the long and the short of this is the pandemic has derailed opportunities to consult with communities that are affected and elements of our university community that are affected by this. And even and equally importantly, perhaps more importantly, it's derailed the marketplace. So it's a bad time to go out and seek bids. And that makes sense to me. But rather than me commenting on it, let's see what other regions have or questions, comments. I don't see any yet. So let me take a moment while folks find their raised hand feature. And if there aren't any, we'll move on and we'll act next month. Mr. Langworthy, anyone interested? No, there's not, Chair McMillan. Okay. And I'm going, well, let me just wait a moment longer here. Okay. Let's move on to item six then, which is, again, review. A lot of review items today. October will be busy. Chair McMillan, Regent Hsu chimed in at the last second there. Regent Hsu, I waited just long enough. I knew you might have a question. Yes, thank you. Thank you for waiting. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Yeah, I just, you know, this has been dragging on for quite a while, and the students have been complaining, and I've seen some very bad pictures of food, and I just would hope that we come to some conclusion on this sooner rather than later. And I'm a little bit concerned about the extension for up to two years, seeing as though maybe only one year would be necessary, but that's something we can discuss at the next meeting. Thank you, Regent Hsu. Regent Rocha, I think you 
got a raised hand in there too. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and, and you know, based on uh, you know, the fact that this is review, I, I, you know, this is a challenge. I, I was hoping that our, the student representatives may have uh, some input for us. Um, it, it, the, the timing, particularly with the transition back to class, I mean, this has obviously been an issue for students now for a couple of years, and I would um, join with Regent Shu's concern about going up to two years. I think that if, you know, I would, I, I could potentially support if the students are um, in concert with it, a, a one-year extension, um, you know, the, obviously the difficulty for, for students to uh, have impact on issues like this is, is the, you know, the fact that they turn over and you know, two years is a lifetime uh, when it comes to student leadership. I think for many people, they just start getting their legs um, when they're juniors and then they're graduating and, and then a whole new generation has to get involved. So to, to be fair to that um, constructive process uh, with, with the students on uh, and and the and the, the university community generally, people that that rely on um, the result of this contract, I, I would like to see it, um, you know, finite. And in, 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 uh, in my support would be contingent on uh, the, the student leadership um, having taken a look at this and, and responding that they believe that there's a legitimate opportunity for them to continue to um, uh, be part of this process. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Rosha. All right. Now we'll move on to, uh, that'll be back before us in October. It was an opportunity for everybody to uh, weigh in in between or at that time. Item six is a uh, Board of Regents policy uh, that we're going to discuss. First of two board policy items and uh, review some proposed amendments to the uh, debt transactions policy. And I believe AVP Volna is going to walk us through uh, this one. Yes. <clears throat> Chair McMillan, members of the board, thank you very much. Before I touch on the uh, edits to the policy, I want to circle back to the question that Regent Powell had asked about the amount of um, refinance debt that we were proposing with the state. Um, when we originally issued that in the 2010 to 2013 range, the um, original principal was $199 million. As of August, of this year, so last month, the outstanding was $153.4 million that we were proposing to refinance. And remember, that was a 75-25 split. So this represents the 75% portion that the state is financing um, through the appropriation. Um, we've already financed the university's 25% portion. If we, um, if we need to wait until next year, which is likely given the... <coughs> legislative process, um, we would probably be refinancing this when the state does its big debt issuance in August of 2021. And at that point, we would expect the amount that we would refinance would be about $146.7 million. So um, that's just uh, the information you requested. I wanted to make sure you got that. Um, so Chair McMillan, uh, would you prefer that I just walk quickly walk through the policy um, changes and edits and then field questions, or would you like me to go through it and field questions as they arise? Now, why don't you uh, get through the, uh, the materials, set the context for us, and then we'll, uh, we'll see questions and input. Okay, all right, great, thank you. Um, as the docket page indicated, in a nutshell, um, the changes that we're making or that we're proposing that you adopt reflect uh, several things. First of all, uh, we are expanding policy guidance within Board of Regents policy um, for the commercial paper facility and the overall program that you approved back in 2017, which expanded um, our commercial paper uh, size to $400 million. Secondly, um, we are making some clarifications um, and adding a few additional items um, around capital leases, the current policy um, definition is a little thin and um, for a variety of reasons, there was no uh, board delegations uh, around capital leases. So we are proposing a threshold for capital lease approval uh, as a debt instrument. <coughs> um, third, the, uh, the clarification, we're making clarifications um, to how debt proceeds can be used. Um, um, the current policy does state that for, um, bond debt can only be used for 
uh, capital project, but it was silent on how the board can uh, approve that. So we're making a change there. And then finally, um, there are a bunch of formatting, formatting and editing changes that just move sections and, and uh, various uh, subdivisions around. Um, if you go to the actual document itself, um, uh, section two, we are updating the definitions to uh, reflect, uh, as I said, uh, clarification of a definition of what a lease is. Um, I think that this is important for a couple of reasons. One, so that we um, are clear on what, what constitutes a lease. Quite frankly, leases can be anything from a real estate lease to a copier lease. And I think it's important that the, um, the definition reflect what really is a lease and that it is really not services, it's goods of, of some sort that we typically acquire. Um, we also are making a number of changes to uh, reflect uh, the commercial paper program, as I said. So for example, we're adding uh, a definition for commercial paper, and we're adding a definition for the commercial paper facility, which is our $400 million program. And then we are also um, adding a definition for a dealer, which represents uh, a, a party involved in the process of issuing and and rolling over commercial paper. So that is uh, really the sum total of the changes in section two. Section three really represents uh, formatting changes. Uh, there isn't a lot of substance in section three. Uh, if you go to section four, um, which represents uh, the reservation and delegation of authority part of the policy, um, as I said, we are making a few changes here under subdivision one to add, expand guidance around the commercial paper program. Essentially what this does is it, um, it says that only the board can expand the dollar amount authorized to issue within the commercial paper facility beyond the 400 million. But within that $400 million program, the administration is authorized to um, issue and refinance and roll commercial paper as long as it's within that $400 million limit. Um, we also are, I believe here, if you look at subdivision one, uh, the new uh, last bullet there, uh, E, we are clarifying that the board would be the only one that could authorize capital leases um, at a million dollars or above. And the reason for that is a couplefold. First of all, current policy is silent on it. It just says the, the board uh, approves capital leases. Um, in reality, as I said, there are many different flavors of capital leases for equipment, for facilities, for real estate. Um, secondly, um, the uh, accounting standards bodies that we follow are issuing new guidance that will be effective in 2022 that will essentially significantly expand what we need to recognize in our financial statements for leases. And what that would mean is you would be approving every $5,000 copier lease, every $3,000 systems lease, whatever it is. Um, and so we feel that this um, relieves the administrative sort of burden on the administration as well as on the board for all of those. It also aligns the threshold for the current thresholds under goods and services and real estate. So it seemed to make some sense to do that. Um, if you then go down to section, so subdivision three in section four uh, delegations, again, we are then also creating the mirror clarification of the delegation there to indicate that below that board threshold, the administration is authorized to um, approve those uh, capital leases for whatever it might be. Um, and then I would say the last set of changes, if you were to go to uh, page 97 of your docket, which is uh, section five, uh, those really represent uh, just some uh, changes that we're making to uh, clarify which rating agency uh, rates us uh, at, by certain categories. They have different categories. The old board policy, the current board policy rather was um, a little muddled in, in how that was presented and this just presents it in a better fashion. So uh, Chair McMillan and members of the board with that, I, uh, I think that covers the high points and I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions you might have. Okay, thank you uh, for that uh, 
Excellent uh, review, and I appreciate, and I know the board does, the amount of work that uh, goes into policy work like this. It, uh, it, it's not easy, and making sure it aligns and coordinates well, which I think this does, is, is all good. And I would just remind the board that uh, you referenced uh, AVP Volna, the $400 million authorization, which I'm told was done via board resolution in 2017, and it, uh, it goes a long, long time into the future. So that number doesn't appear in this, in this resolution that's done independently. But my question before I turn to a couple of region questions here is, um, the commercial paper piece was something that uh, um, Senior Vice President Burnett talked about often. Does that still remain our cheapest source of, uh, of short-term money? I know he talked about it often as being very, very low cost. So I don't know if that's for you or uh, Vice President Tonneson. But. Um, Chair McMillan, members of the board, I can respond to that. Um, we've actually had a little bit of uh, activity in the last two weeks um, as Short, it, so to back up, if you understand how commercial paper works, it is a very short-term debt instrument. It's typically issued for no more than 270 days, oftentimes for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, what have you. Uh, in the last week and a half or two weeks, we have been um, hitting a couple points where short-term CP reached its maturity, and so we sort of reissued it through a roll process. We have typically been rolling those in the 17 to 20 basis point uh, range, which wow. essentially is less than a quarter of a percent interest. So imagine rolling $18 million of debt for 90 days and paying $7,000 of interest on it. That's the kind of cost of funds we are seeing right now on, on commercial paper. It is a very, very inexpensive way to finance things in the short run. Very good. Well, uh, that's amazing. And uh, it's such low cost interest. It almost makes me feel sorry for the banker in the group, which takes me <laughs> to Regent Beeson. <laughs> I think you're unmuted. You need to unmute. Mr. Chair, thank you for those crocodile tears. <laughs> uh, ABP Volna, thank you. This is a good cleanup bill, uh, both in terms of the, the um, uh, form of the policy, but also introducing some, some important policy changes. Um, the commercial paper program has been a huge success. Uh, the, the former senior vice president Burnett brought it to us from his previous employer and the timing couldn't have been better. The timing was intentional because of the way rates were dropping. The amount of money we've saved through that program has been really, uh, really significant. And, and um, the, there, so there is some downside. Uh, uh, there's some upside from, um, uh, from um, um, that, uh, you know, struggles in the economy. And this is certainly one of them for us. I do like the, um, I like introducing the, idea subject to board approval of, of uh, being able to borrow a longer term for operating purposes. I know that's, that's been not, that's been something we haven't done before. And it's usually we don't borrow. Uh, we try to match up the borrowing term with the, uh, with the uh, life of the assets, but there may be a unique circumstance that will, uh, uh, that would make sense for us to borrow longer term for, for, um, basic operating uh, needs. And then finally, uh, Regent Roche and I worked now, I think uh, two years ago on the thresholds, trying to standardize the thresholds, looking at, you know, bring them all um, fairly consistent. And so I, I do support the $1 million uh, and sort of elaboration of the, the lease part of the thresholds and trying to bring that into compliance with what, we've, what we um, worked on uh, two years ago. Thank you. Thank you, Regent uh, Beeson, for those uh, perspectives. Uh, let's see, Regent uh, Shu and then Regent Anderson, I think. Regent Shu. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, my question is, <clears throat> one of the changes in here is that uh, 
we are now considering using debt for funding uh, university operating purposes. And I'm just kind of wondering wh where that's coming from. What, did, uh, what was the last, uh, or when was the last time we actually did that, if ever? And um, there doesn't seem to be any limitations on that other than what's below that. And secondly, where does the $1 million uh, limitation come from? Thank you. Uh, very good. I think that my understanding is that uh, we'll let Regent or sorry, uh, um, AVP Volna respond. But my understanding from a governance perspective is that we're permitting in the future the administration to bring to us a uh, borrowing uh, proposal that would include the use of it for operating funds, but we're not authorizing them to do anything like that. Today, they couldn't even bring it because it wouldn't be permitted. But let's let uh, AVP Volna bring that forward and then also tackle the $1 million question. Uh, thank you, Chair McMillan, Regent Shu, and others. Yes, um, the current policy um, has a blanket prohibition on the use of um, debt to fund operations. Now, presumably, the board could have decided to make an exception to its, pol its policy at some point. Um, this merely sort of codifies within the policy that the board is the only one that is authorized to allow that to happen. Um, uh, as a practical ma matter, um, I have been here since 92 and I have not recalled ever using, that we've ever used debt to finance operations. Julie Tonneson may also have some perspective or Mike Burleson may have some perspective on that. Um, the, the reason I think it is sort of important at this point in time to be clear about this is because while I think all of us in the finance organization think that um, financing ongoing operations with debt is a bad idea, um, the reality is that you also want um, to line up um, your options and your levers, so to speak, um, to be able to address uh, unique circumstances. And I think we would all agree that right now we are in unique circumstances. Um, we, uh, you, you may recall that we previously told you we took out a, a line of credit. Um, that is certainly one way to provide emergency liquidity for operations if necessary. But as I just said, with the, um, the cost of funds related to commercial paper being so low, um, to the extent that we were to need liquidity in an emergency and to the extent that we were uh, able to do it through commercial paper, that would certainly be the lowest cost way to finance an emergency that we might need to, to provide for. So, so that's really the kind of the, I think the background on it. At this time, we are not presenting or proposing that we do that, but we want to make sure that both the administration and the board has the ability to do that if necessary. Um, with respect to the uh, question about where did the $1 million come from? Um, as I said, uh, our goal was to try and make sure that um, every capital lease as will be defined in the new governmental accounting standards board doesn't have to go through board approval. It would be very inconsistent with how we handle other types of purchases or real estate transactions. So. Uh, for the combination of administrative expediency and to align that threshold with existing board thresholds, uh, we thought a million dollars was the right number. Mr. Chair? Yes, uh, Regent Chu, follow up. Uh, yes, thank you, AV AVP Volna, for that uh, uh, answer. Uh, could you give me an idea of how many capital or how many leases we're doing right now and that are less than a million dollars? Is this a huge number or is it a small number? Uh, uh, AVP Volna, capital leases specifically, yeah. right? Leases. Chair McMillan, Regent Shu, it's a good question. Um, you know, to put it in some context, the board only approves about a hundred purchases per year that are over a million dollars. Of those a hundred or 115 that you see, in my recollection, the only ones that aren't a straight up purchase typically represent either um, a software licensing agreement or a very, very large piece of equipment such as an MRI um, 
uh, magnetic res resonance imaging uh, equipment that might be used, let's say, in um, uh, the medical school or what have you. Um, below that, the leases are almost always um, equipment uh, of either an IT or an office nature. So um, things like servers, things like hardware, things like copiers, those kinds of things. Um, Beyond that realm of purchasing, you actually see a lot of leases now. They're, they're typically real estate leases, and, and you will continue to see those. So that's sort of my best estimate of, of what you don't see today that goes through as a lease. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks for that uh, comprehensive uh, answer. We don't have any other uh, regents uh, Indicating, uh, Regent Anderson. Ah, well, you're sitting right next to me and I blew right past you. I knew you <laughs> wanted to speak. Regent Anderson. Thank you, Regent McMillan. It's kind of the story of my life. Um, <laughs> so, so here we go. Everybody forgets about me. Um, <laughs> I'm going to have a, a general question for, for Mr. Vaughn in a moment, but uh, any talk of the debt and the debt of the university. And, and just to be true, I, I looked up on this deal, it says, what Regent Shu was talking about, what we're codifying is it says debt may not be used to fund university operating purposes without board approval. It's not we're allowing it may not be used. But no discussion of, of debt here at the university can uh, be brought up without talking about my predecessor, Regent Emeritus Clyde Allen. Debt was his big thing. And he told me, when you get there, Tom, make sure you use the debt of that university judiciously. And there'll always be a time we might need some dry powder. And uh, I've tried to follow that in, on my uh, work on the debt management committee. And, and, you know, if ever, there may be a time we need dry powder coming up in this, in this COVID world. My question to Regent, or to, uh, I'm giving him a demotion also to uh, AVP Volna, is uh, I was looking on here about uh, standard and fours and things. In general, are we seeing American colleges and universities having standard fours or Moody's downgrades or anything like that in this environment? AVP Volna. Um, Chair McMillan and Regent Anderson, um, I would say that um, throughout the just normal course of the last five or 10 years, there have been a handful of institutions that have experienced downgrades. In some cases, there have been a few upgrades. I would say the downgrades that we have seen have basically um, been a result of um, <coughs> risks taken or management decisions made that were not in the best interest of the institution and didn't put the, the, um, the debt in the proper context. Um, and so, for example, I think it was two or three years ago, Northwestern University was downgraded from a AAA to a AA one or something. I believe it has since been upgraded again. What I would say about the current environment is that um, while, um, while we certainly are in a challenging time, I think every institution, maybe particularly public institutions that rely on state support um, will be challenged. And I think what that will translate to, um, as I had tried to say earlier, um, when the question came up about uh, debt capacity, we will continue to have the debt capacity that we need and the dry powder that you referred to. I think what we and, and maybe many other institutions will do is face ratings pressure um, because the rating agencies continue to look at um, key metrics like operating margins and liquidity and uh, balance sheet ratios and such. And as we go through this, um, it, it could be that um, our ratios do move in, in, a, in a negative fashion um, as we kind of work our way through it. So I think there will be ratings pressure across the industry. Um, I think the advantage we have is we are starting from a point where we are essentially one notch below AAA, which is a very favorable place to be. Um, we have never been downgraded. We have experienced um, a shift from a stable outlook to a negative outlook, I believe maybe 10 or 12 years ago. And then we were, um, shortly thereafter, we were able to regain that stable outlook. So um, I think, I hope that answers your question. It does. And I, I'll just say from my, my 
uh, work on the debt management committee. I think we have terrific people who are operating that department for the university. So I'm, I'm excited. Uh, Regent McMillan, that uh, ends my comments and you can forget about me now as long as you'd like. <laughs> well, thank you for uh, channeling our former colleague from uh, Moorhead. And uh, yes, I recall his insistence on, on jet to do, debt judiciousness. So um, good discussion. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Volna, we will be back uh, to this item for action next month. And we move on to item seven. And this is a uh, this is purely what I would call a housekeeping item at this point. We are consolidating some Board of Regent policies. And uh, basically, the board has directed the Office of the Board of Regents to reduce the total number of board policies through consolidation or elimination where possible. The proposed consolidation does not change the substance of either the selection of design professionals and wage rates for contractors policies, but simply combines them into one policy, given that the topics are very closely related and uh, generally interrelated. Vice President Bertelson works in this space, and he's here to respond to any questions since his office gets to implement all this, but uh, I don't think he has prepared remarks unless... Uh, Someone has questions for him. Is that correct, Vice President Bertelson? That's correct. You did a great summary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. So, uh, Mr. Langworthy, I see we have uh, one regent, uh, Regent Mayor on. Yes, I'm, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chair McMillan. I'm thinking given that this is truly just a housekeeping item that, and with the desire to try and take things off our agenda for October, big or small if possible. I'm thinking that it would make sense to move this from a review to a request, make a request that this be for both review and action at this meeting unless other regions object to that happening. Then of course we'd take it up in October, but it seems to me given all we've done is to combine two policies and there are no substantive changes we could act on it at this time. So that would be my request. I don't know if I need to make it as a motion, but I'd like to see that we act on this uh, in this meeting today. Uh, Regent Mayeron, thank you for that. And uh, yes, uh, planning ahead to October is looking uh, like it's gonna be busy with plenty to do. So I appreciate that, but let me uh, just walk through board policy here quickly. Any region can ask for an item to be converted from review to review and action, as long as no other member of the board objects to doing so. So you don't need to make it a motion. I've heard the request and I'm now gonna ask the board if any member objects to a review action today on that item rather than review today and action next month. So let's open it up here to see if anyone objects. Mr. Langworthy, let me know. Chair McMillan, I don't see any hands up. Oh, uh, Regent Kenyanya has his hand up. Regent Kenyanya, do you have a question or do you object to uh, consolidation and review action today? Uh, question slash comment, Mr. Chair. Very good, go ahead. Um, I, I was gonna ask of the administration if there's a, a benefit to them in having this um, codified today. Um, and I only say that because I'm not inherently opposed to switching it to review and action. But um, as much as we've had a chance to review it and, and we're comfortable, I, I think, you know, in, in a governance sense, our review one month and then action the next month isn't just for ourselves, but it's also an opportunity to put this in front of the university community, all, all matters, to, and, and give, you know, students, staff, faculty, and the general public a, a month to, to look at our matters and, and chime in should they want to. Again, I don't have a specific concern with this one, but absent... Uh, uh, a benefit to the administration to do it, I, I think we should always try to stick with that review one month action the next. Thank you. Under, understood. Thank you, Regent Kenyanya. So I'm not taking that as an objection, but I do want to give uh, Vice President Bertelson a chance to weigh in and uh, let us know if there's uh, you're fully on board with this and if there's a benefit to moving forward now today with review action or what do you think? Um, Mr. Chair and Regents, um, because there's no change in the policy content, it um, and it's just a formatting structure. Um, it doesn't make um, really any difference to us the timing of the change. All right. 
Okay, well then I'm going to treat that as standing for review and action today and uh, would direct then uh, Mr. Langworthy to, well, first of all, we need a motion to do all of this today because it wasn't before us with a motion. So is there a motion from the- Chair McMillan, Regent Rocha. I see Rocha, Regent Rocha has a hand up. Regent Rocha. Mr. Chair, I would move the resolution. Thank you, Regent Rocha. Uh, is there a second? I'll second it, Chair. Thank you, Regent Powell. So, Mr. Langworthy, would you call the roll on, uh, on item number, is this number seven on our docket? Chair McMillan, on the adoption of consolidation of Board of Regents policy selection of design professionals and wage rates for contractors. Regent Anderson? Yes. Regent Anderson votes yes. Regent Beeson? Yes. Regent Beeson votes yes. Regent Davenport? Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Herr is absent. Regent Shu. Yes. Regent Shu votes yes. Regent Kinyanya. Yes. Regent Kinyanya votes yes. Regent Mayron. Yes. Regent Mayron votes yes. Regent Powell. Yes. Regent Powell votes yes. Regent Rocha. Yes. Regent Rocha votes yes. Regent Simonson. Yes. Regent Simonson votes yes. Regent Swiggum. Yes. Regent Swiggum votes yes. Chair McMillan. Yes. Chair McMillan votes yes. Chair McMillan, there are 11 yes votes and zero no votes. Very good. By a vote of 11 to zero, the uh, motion to approve the consolidation of these policies is approved. On to our consent agenda, the last item of business for us today. And uh, at the outset of this item, I'm going to actually, from the chair's perspective, separate out the, uh, the employment agreement with uh, Mr. Franz and uh, ask that that be handled separately and then turn to the committee to see if there are other items that they'd like to have treated individually or moved or acted on individually. Do you see any hands, Mr. Mr. Langworthy? I do not, Chair McMillan. All right, then we're going to uh, we're going to ask President Gable, I think, to well, no, let's do it this way. Since I pulled that out, why don't we have Interim Vice President Tonneson identify anything? in the remaining items in the consent report, and then we'll come back to President Gable on the uh, Franz employment agreement. So we'll act on the consent agenda as it is compiled at accepting the Franz employment agreement, and then we'll come back to that. Vice President Tonneson, anything you wanna call up for us in the consent report? Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, just in summary then, the amended consent report does include the general contingency report there. I just wanted to mention there are items listed there, but those are only a summary to get us to the start starting point for this year's activity. There's no new activity to report and no approvals requested this month for the general contingency report. There are four purchases of a million dollars or over, uh, two related to purchases by research animal resources and two by facilities management. There is the resolution related to issuance of debt of up to 123 million, which will be a mix of taxable and tax exempt debt. There is one real estate transaction amending a lease for the medical discovery team space, space in Duluth and two capital budget amendments for the medical school. Uh, one for renovation of clinical space and the office space on the Twin Cities campus and one for renovation of classroom space on the Duluth campus. Uh, and that is all that would remain then in the consent agenda. I, agenda I would be happy to address or phone a friend uh, to respond to any questions that the committee may have on any of those particular items. All right, thank you for that summary. Um, is there a motion on the board to approve the consent agenda as uh, accepted? I'll move to approve the consent agenda absent the employment agreement. Very good, is there a second? So I second it. Any questions then for uh, for Vice President Tonneson on the item she summarized? <clears throat> Any questions?
questions, Mr. Langworthy, you're seeing? I am not, Chair McMillan. All right, then I would ask you to call the roll on the consent report absent the Franz Employment Agreement. On the motion to recommend approval of the consent report except the Franz appointment, Regent Anderson? Yes. Regent Anderson votes yes. Regent Beeson? Regent Beeson? Yes. Regent Beeson votes yes. Regent Davenport is absent. Regent Herr is absent. Regent Hsu? Yes. Regent Hsu votes yes. Regent Kenyanya? Yes. Regent Kenyanya votes yes. Regent Mehron? Yes. Regent Mehron votes yes. Regent Powell? Yes. Regent Powell votes yes. Regent Rocha? Yes. Regent Rocha votes yes. Regent Simonson? Yes. Regent Simonson votes yes. Regent Swiggum? Yes. Regent Swiggum votes yes. Chair McMillan? Yes. Chair McMillan votes yes. Regent McMillan, there are 10 yes votes, zero no votes. Very good, Mr. Langworthy. Thank you. That motion carries on a 10 to 0 vote to approve the consent agenda minus one item, which we will now turn to. And I will ask President Gable to introduce this topic and we will we will jump in. Thank you, Chair McMillan, Vice Chair Beeson, members of the committee. Today, I recommend to you the appointment of Myron Franz to the position of Senior Vice President for Finance and Operations, effective September 30th. He's a recognized leader in strategic financial management, most recently having served under Governor Tim Walz as the Commissioner of Minnesota's Management and Budget Office, or better known as MMB. In this role, he served the state of Minnesota as Chief Financial Officer, Chief Accounting Officer, Chief Human Resources Officer, and the State Controller, driving innovation and flexibility in the state's $47 billion annual budget. Myron will bring incredible experience, knowledge, and strategic stewardship to our operations system-wide. We can evolve with his leadership in ways that will make us better and more innovative while also navigating some of our challenges. The Senior Vice President for Finance and Operations at the University of Minnesota is a critical leadership position, serving in three critical roles for the system. It is our CFO, our COO, and our treasurer. Given the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, no time is more important than now to have a seasoned finance leader like Myron as part of our leadership team. His service to the state of Minnesota will be instrumental to our success, and his ability to advise me and this board on the financial future of the University of Minnesota is unparalleled. Myron will receive an annual base salary of $399,000, which will be then immediately subject to the current 10% pay reduction taken by members of the President's Cabinet. It is also approximately 6% less than the current base salary that Brian Burnett was earning. Myron will also receive deferred compensation payments, but we have deferred that deferred compensation out by two years in light of the financial challenges facing the university. Looking forward to June 2022, Myron's total compensation, base salary plus deferred compensation, will still be less than Brian Burnett's current compensation as SVP would have been at that time. Members of the committee, per Board of Regents policy, employee compensation and recognition, the university strives to achieve and maintain a compensation structure that when combined with benefits and other rewards is competitive to our peers and serves to attract and retain high performance workforce. In the setting of initial salaries and subsequent pay adjustments, the university considers the work responsibilities, the market of our peers, internal equity, experience and expertise, performance and other criteria as appropriate. The Office of Human Resources reports to the board annually the COOPA salary survey data for senior leader positions amongst our peers. Based on this market data, Myron's base salary is $9,000 below the 50th percentile. <clears throat> I wanna take this moment to thank Brian Burnett, our outgoing senior vice president for his service, his passion and his commitment to the university. We're very grateful that Brian will be serving as an advisor to me through March 2nd, 2021. And my special thanks to Julie Tonson for agreeing to serve as interim senior vice president until September 30th. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very good, thank you, uh, President Gable. So I would uh, first of all seek a motion to approve this and then we can, uh, we can discuss it. So, so 
Very good. It's moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. All right. I'd open it up now to board members for comments, questions, and otherwise. Use the raised hands feature or wave violin at me, okay? Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I appreciate the President Gable's introduction to the topic. I think like many members of the board, I was surprised by the announcement of this appointment. Obviously, this is important. It's one of the top three positions at the university. And it came a bit out of the blue, even from a region's perspective. And I'm not clear on what the community consultation was. And that's relevant only to the extent that we should recall this moment when we have conversations about shared governance and searches and retentions of this variety. A bit of a side topic. But I laid out my concerns to the board in an email earlier this week. And I hope you received that. My concerns in this matter are not at all a criticism of Commissioner Franz. I think President Gable laid out very well the remarkable experience and capacity that Commissioner Franz brings to this position. My past experience as a regent during the service of Gus Donhow, Senior Vice President, with similar credentials and experience gives me great optimism about the potential effectiveness of soon-to-be Senior Vice President Franz. But the painful distinction for me in this transition between Commissioner Donhow's experience and Commissioner Franz illustrates a higher ed market that's really out of control. Boards like ours are in the position to address these issues. But for a number of years, they have not stepped forward to do that. It's important to note that when Senior Vice President Donhow came over as Commissioner of Finance, he received a modest increase in his compensation when he joined the university compared to his commissioner position with the state. And what's been presented to us in Finnish Forum, what's before us today, is with the eventual deferred compensation of nearly $480,000 a year, which includes the deferred when it does best. Currently, as a commissioner, the candidate is paid just shy of $155,000. This university contract represents a salary of 300% of his current compensation, despite the position at the state overseeing a budget roughly 10 times the U of M budget and with more employees. Now, this is a pretty clear example, and I think to some extent for some folks may be held up as an example of the problem with higher ed costs today. When you have the same person performing a larger job, moving to another position just down the road and receiving a raise of over 200%. And there's really no logical basis to do that, that dramatic increase, beside claiming that based on these reports, everybody else is doing it. And it's really an indefensible transfer from students, oftentimes through debt, to the administration. Now, you know, how do we, as an institution facing unprecedented fiscal challenges, justify doing this? We're going to ask for support from the state and federal government to make it through this. We'll ask students to pay fully for educational opportunities with a clear diminution in their experience. And we'll be asking specific units in the university and departments to make severe sacrifices, and many employees making a small fraction of this compensation package will be completely out of work. Now, not having been consulted or informed in advance about this transition or the compensation package for the senior vice president, I regret that the email that I sent last week, and to which I did not receive a response in this meeting right now, are the only opportunities I have to raise these concerns. Now, if we proceed and approve this, I just ask each member of this board and our senior leaders to remember this moment when it comes time to criticize the legislature in the coming months for not placing the university higher on the exhaustive list of entities seeking support for their very survival. And for those of us who engaged in governance at a time when the commitment to the university's public mission was shepherded by leaders who were very talented and were compensated as much by that sense of service as they were by compensation much greater than the public that they serve, this is disappointing, and I won't be able to support this contract as it is presented. Thank you. All right. 
Uh, let's see, Regent uh, Rocha, Regent Beeson, and then Regent Kenyanya. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I would urge uh, all of us to take the take the 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 um, the large view on this. We do recruit nationally, and we should. We do recruit from all the sectors, including the private sector and the public sector, and we should. And I think as an institution, we can only have one compensation philosophy. It's really doesn't work to carve out positions um, uh, based on what somebody's last employment um, agreement um, uh, resulted, uh, resulted in. It just, that is really unworkable. Our philosophy has been, and I think it's served the university well, is look at the marketplace look at the marketplace. And in this case, we have an eminently qualified candidate who could easily command this kind of money, likely more money if he chose to go back into the business world, which is where he was successful for 20 years. The fact that he took a time out uh, for a number of years to provide public service, um, you know, what we, it was is great, but, um, you know, we're now competing for his services uh, with businesses, and uh, I think we're getting great value. And I would urge us to stay with uh, with the plan that we get. We have. We are, as a whole, we're well within uh, the marketplace. In fact, among the senior leaders, we're below the we're, we're below the medium. And there is really nothing more important than hiring senior people and getting them right. And I can tell you, whatever amount that we think we're overpaying people, those are those premiums are more than made up day one with the work that they do and the difference that they make, and the 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 savings that they create, and the the outcomes that they create. So I think it's a it's an investment. It's not an expense, and I would support the appointment of Mr. Franz for this position. Thank you, uh, Regent Beeson, Regent uh, Kenyanya, and then Regent Powell. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair um, and President Gable. Um, as I mean, previously stated, um, you know, I find myself thinking similarly to Regent Rocha in some ways. Um, and again, just want to echo in no way, you know, a statement on, on Commissioner Franz and, and his experience and his value. Um, but you, I, I won't, you know, overstated or talk on this too much, but Regent Beeson said something uh, stuck out to me. He said that, you know, the commissioner took a break from the private sector and decided to do public service and took that cut. And that's where, I mean, that's where my mind always gets stuck is because I view higher education administration as a public service. Um, I, you know, not all higher education, but especially in a public university, I view it as a public service and clearly the marketplace has not done that. Um, all the, everything the president said is true. Um, the, the, where our administrators fall and the percentages and all that, but that's all true if we accept that the marketplace says what it should be. And I, I think what's happened has happened because boards across the country haven't stopped it. Um, and I think we're in a position to do so. Um, and, you know, I, I know last time we had this similar conversation back in December, um, you know, many of my colleagues, you know, raised the fair point in that, how do you go about this? You know, is it individual by individual? There should be a more systematic, strategic way in going about it. And it's a fair point, but we're almost here a year later and I haven't heard that conversation. Um, so without, you know, speaking too much on it, in no way a comment on on the, the commissioner or or the assumption or the the, the rationale for the salary, um, I would just punctuate it by saying, I think higher ed administration should be a public service um, and it's not quite treated as such anymore and that we're comparing with private sector. Um, so thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Regent Powell. Oh, thank you, uh, uh, Chair McMillan. Um, <laughs> I um, just a few comments. I, I very strongly support uh, this contract. Uh, I think Mr. Franz will be. Uh, this is an will be an outstanding appointment. Uh, we will be very very pleased that we've uh, appointed him to be one of the top three 
uh, officers of this university. I think the reason you see the market in these positions developing the way it has is because I think that, you know, our peers across the country understand that, you know, this position, which is a, a top officer position within the university, is very, very high leverage. And when you get the, when you get the very strong talent, uh, you know, you, you, the, the right person will create tremendous value uh, for the university uh, 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 down the road. And that's why there's a willingness uh, to pay. It's, it's as simple as that. And so I, I think that he will be uh, uh, an outstanding uh, top financial officer. He's very <clears throat> experienced. He's well known uh, within the legislature and, you know, and very, very highly appreciated, uh, you know, for his ability. Uh, and he's here, you know, he is, he's in the state and he's, he's ready to start, uh, you know, very soon. So uh, I think we'll be very, very pleased, uh, you know, with, with this appointment. And I think that uh, his salary is well positioned uh, within the peer set. And so uh, strong support. All right, uh, Regent Swiggum. And then Regent Shu. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, uh, and colleagues, I, uh, I, I speak in support of the Franz appointment. Um, and I do, I do that with, with concern. And I certainly have concerns about uh, higher education salaries uh, uh, amongst around the country, not just at the University of Minnesota, but, or, but or certainly around the country. But but while I am certainly aware of that, there's there's always the but. Uh, the but is this: uh, first and foremost, President Gable has the right; she has the opportunity to put her team together. She has the right to do that. In fact, I think it was just two months ago, or less than two months ago, we had the Presidential Performance Review, and we alluded in that. We, we, we stated that, that she has the right to put her team together and she should move forward on that. Uh, secondly, as has already been stated, uh, France has extensive public finance experience. Extensive. Uh, we're getting a really, really decent, experienced guy here who is, who is respected by both sides of the aisle at the legislature. Uh, and I think these relationships that he has at the legislature will, will certainly help us in standing with, uh, with both Democrats and Republicans in the legislature and with the governor. I, th I think th that point, too, is very, very important. And then three and four, as has been mentioned before, uh, you know, we're, we're hiring a person with less, at less than 50 percent of the, uh, his colleagues, uh, peer colleagues around the uh, higher education institutions. I've believe it was probably just in the Big Ten. And we're hiring them for less than we are paying our current or the former CFO, Mr. Burnett. So you add all those things together, and it, and it seems very reasonable, responsive, and we're getting a very, very experienced, decent decision maker that I think is going to put our university in better stead financially in the future and in better stead with the, uni with the, uh, with the legislature, our, our friends over in St. Paul. So I strongly speak in support of the uh, Franz appointment and, and specifically uh, President Gable's right uh, to put her team together. All right, uh, Regent Shu uh, and then Regent Mayeron, and I think we're winding down. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I, I support the appointment, but I do not support the contract. And uh, I would agree with um, many of the things that uh, were stated by Regents uh, Rosha and Kenyanya. I, I'm concerned with the optics on this because while we have an opportunity to get someone who is uh, experienced and well-known to the state, I, I do think that people are going to look at us uh, when we go back for our, um, you know, uh, next round of appropriations. I think they're going to look at us um, in, in, a, in a way that I think it would be negative. And um, as I was arguing for parity before, uh, I, I'm not sure that we can achieve that uh, by making the decisions that we're making. I think I was, I was excited that he was in our search the last time. 
I was excited when I heard his name come up this time, although I didn't even know that we were looking for somebody this time. Uh, so I, I feel that, you know, I, I've been left out of the loop on this completely. Uh, in fact, we're not even, we weren't, aren't even offered to uh, uh, meet with him by Zoom until next week. So, uh, you know, I can't support the contract, but I, I do support the appointment. And I hope he does good work and um, look forward to hearing more about that. Thank you. Regent Mayra. Thank you. I think that Regent Beeson uh, laid out for me the arguments why I will support this uh, appointment. And, and I think that, let me just say, I think everyone agrees that substantively, uh, uh, Myron Franz is an excellent candidate for this position. And what we're talking about is his compensation package. I believe that, uh, again, as stated by Regent Beeson, that we need a philosophy of compensation that governs all positions and doesn't cherry pick particular positions. And I think that that's what would be happening if we did this here. I think that if, if the mar I believe that that philosophy has to be uh, what the market requires in order to fill the position and that the market must look at what others peers are doing uh, around the country and that market is not simply driven by fed, uh, state agencies, public agencies, but rather the market that individuals are drawn from are not only the private sector, but private colleges, private universities, public universities. And we need to see what our peers are doing in that regard as they set compensation for any position, including this position as well. So while I certainly can appreciate that Mr. Franz makes substantially less uh, working for the state government in his offering his services for public service, and I certainly understand Regent Kenyani's view that anybody who works for a public institution is also serving the public. That is true. But I think that at the end of the day, we have to look at the compensation systems uh, that drive each of those particular entities, whether it's public agencies for a state, or in this case, a public university. And the fact of the matter is that a public university draws from a different, a pool of candidates who can command salaries that are substantially more than others in other parts of the uh, uh, state agency system such as for the state of Minnesota. And if we are going to get those candidates and have the very best candidates, as I think we've done across the board, whether it be the medical school, whether it be athletics, we look to what others, how they are being paid and what it is that they can command in order to bring them here. So for that reason, and consistent with the philosophy, what I think is an appropriate philosophy for driving compensation, I will support of the resolution with respect to Mr. Franz. Thank you, Regent Mayron. We've got one other regent in the uh, queue here who hasn't spoken, and then, uh, and then a regent who has spoke. And we need to move on here quickly. So I'm going to call on Regent Simonson. And uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, um, it's interesting. I, I certainly support the candidate but I do struggle with some of the issues that Regent Rocha and Kenyana, Regent Kenyana brought up, especially concerning watching the budget stuff. I'm just wondering, did this come up, uh, President Gable, did this come up in discussions before <clears throat> taking the offer, uh, looking at this thing as a, uh, I understand everything that was said, but did it come up before? Question. President Gable, yep. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, Regent Simonson, uh, we had a robust negotiation over his salary. As you can see, it's a structured arrangement that reflects a lot of conversations. I'm not sure um, which component you're asking about having come up before. Well, the, the, Regent well, Simonson. Basically, thank you, Chair. Basically, what Regent Roshaw pointed out. You know, 300% or whether, whatever increase. I understand competition. I deal with it in private business all the time. And 
and appreciate that. And going again, not a question of the candidate at all, <clears throat> but looking at our overall policy and, and what was on, like uh, Regent Kanata said, public service, all that stuff. Um, no thoughts on that. Huh? President Gable. Uh, Chair McMillan, Regent Simonson, um, Mr. Franz is aware that there are members of the board who feel that um, employees of the university should be paid comparably to their state agency counterparts. We did discuss that. He was also presented with the COOPA data, which is what we present to the board annually, and with the policy language that reflects the market and the data that supports that market. And we reached an comp the compromise salary that you see represented based on that. Anything further, Regent Simons? Thank you, Chair. Nothing else. Thank you. All right, uh, Regent Rocha, I'm going to uh, permit you an opportunity to, to close us up, and uh, we need to keep moving, so please make it as concise as you can. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the indulgence. I, I agree with the, with the previous speakers that we should have one philosophy of compensation. I just don't believe it should be the one that we have. Um, as a clarification, you know, the, 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 when you add the deferred compensation, it puts this position over the 75th percentile um, on that data. And it also is greater than the current senior vice president, I believe, with, with deferred. But nonetheless, it, it's, you know, I understand that, that individuals could command greater compensation at other opportunities. I would point out that as regents, uh, we would command greater compensation mowing lawns or running a lemonade stand. We do this as a public <laughs> service. We are not pay. Uh, Regent Sviggum may be throwing bales. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, so so this is a group that, you know, because we are not compensated by finances, we don't have a mooring point to understand that value. And I think that's a challenge and something that the state probably ought to take a look at. But, you know, I, I just, I'll close with this. I, you know, we understood the same issue. We understood that there was the same competition for this talent, you know, 30 years ago. Um, and yet we still continue to attract top talent that put the university on the course that it's on right now. Uh, Senior Vice President Dunhow is as talented as anybody you would have found in the private sector or the public sector. And he did amazing work for the university during his relatively short tenure here. And, and, and in doing so, and in doing it at a rate that recognized the public nature of the university and the fact that students struggle, we have food insecurity, we have families taking out debt to, to have an opportunity to, to, to pursue a university education. Um, we made a much better case at that point to the legislature that we needed additional state funding because they understood how we were going to be stewards of that. And so, you know, the bottom line is I've been to the mountaintop. I've seen what it looks like when you have a cast of very talented people um, uh, that are willing to do it uh, on that basis. You know, humans are great at rationalizing, and I think that we've rationalized our way into why this works. But the rest of the world doesn't see it the same way, uh, particularly when we are hat in hand asking for money from the legislature every year. So, um, again, I think Commissioner Franz has got a wonderful resume and, and based on my past experience with people similarly situated, I think he's gonna do a fantastic job for the university. I look forward to finally getting to meet him, uh, but a, a, as it stands, I will not support the contract. Thank you. Regent Kenyanya, last word here from, uh, from the region two. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just, just a closing comment as well. Um, yeah, I, I agree that this, probably isn't the best way to do it. I mean, it doesn't feel right doing it this way. Um, and it didn't last December as well. Um, it, it's just, I'm not sure how else to go about that. I, I think this, this offer makes complete sense under this system. My, the, I take issue with the system in itself. And I just want to comment that I think it's, it's convenient and a little untrue um, as, as a governing board to just kind of resign ourselves and say, well, you know, th this is the market without recognizing that the market is driven by governing boards across the country. Um, and, you know, my, we're not necessarily responsible, but as, as, as uh, governing boards in general are, you know, if, if we got together at AGB next year with all the boards and said, this is what we're going to do. I mean, that's what would happen. Um, so I just want to say that it's not completely fair to resign ourselves and say, well, this is, this is how this, the market is driven without recognizing that we drive the market and are, are part of it. Uh, but thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, President Gable, any closing thoughts? Uh, just a couple of clarifying points, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, um, it is not the 75th percentile. The Coupa data is base salary only. We've, we've clarified that before. Um, the deferred compensation referred to reflects two years of deferred compensation. So even if it was included, it wouldn't be the 75th percentile. 
but those percentiles are based on base salary, apples to apples comparison. Lots of people receive either deferred comp, housing supplements, things that we don't provide that are not included. So it has to be base salary to base salary to be an accurate factual comparison. The other point I'll make is that markets are set by supply and demand. Markets are not set by people setting constructs around them. And the supply and demand is dictated by the policy that refers to institutional peers. So if we're going to change markets by decision, I, I, I would discourage us from thinking about it that way and instead think about why we are competing for really strong talent, how we compete for really strong talent and be very grateful that this is one of the tools we're able to use to attract people to this wonderful institution. Thank you. Thank you, President Gable. I'll share a couple thoughts and then we'll take the roll call vote. We need top talent in this position and we can't have an EVP and CFO that uh, doesn't fit in that top talent category. And talents, markets for talents, as much as we'd like it, aren't defined by us. Can we ultimately steer them a little bit? I don't know, but I think we ignore markets at our risk and our peril as an organization. Our market in higher ed is higher than the public sector from which uh, Mr. Franz is joining us, but it's considerably lower than the market for this talent in the private sector. So we sit somewhere in between that. We'd all like to be lower, but I don't think we can get there on our own. And uh, a bargain CFO isn't what we need right now. Does this Gable administration need to bend the cost curve and work on cutting administrative expenses? Absolutely. You bet they do. And I will be looking for aggressive and visionary ways that this administration can rethink our business model in years ahead, but we have to have the team in place to do that. And that's what President Gable is doing with this hire. I said when we were considering the other major employment contract back in March, several of these things, and I'm gonna repeat them quickly now, but reducing administrative expense is a key element of lowering our overall costs and consequently addressing rising tuition, student debt, overall cost of attendance, but it's one element. It is one element and salaries paid to administrators are certainly a, a major element, but one only in, in that equation. I, I believe that far more critical cost reduction measures must be found in all of the following ways. Centralization, third party service delivery, headcount across administration, faculty, staff, org chart restructuring, program prioritization, modality evolution as we think about that, how we deliver across our education research and outreach segments, and perhaps most importantly of all, and this is a painful thing for any of us to talk about, but we got severe overcapacity in the higher education marketplace in Minnesota. It's a public four-year issue and a private college issue when compared to the high school senior demographics facing us for the next decade to two decades, I think we've got to deal with that if we really want to get to the bottom of some of the challenges we face fiscally. So we've got an opportunity to hire a world-class CFO with the kind of experience we need. We're within $10,000 of what we hired the current EVP CFO for four years ago, and which I know received unanimous approval of this board at that time. Only five of us remain from that board, but all of us voted for that. And uh, I think overall, this is a strong opportunity to fill out President Gable's senior team and move us forward into a world where we can get going on the kind of cost reduction efforts that we need to really make a difference. So with that, Mr. Langworthy, I'd ask you to call the vote. On the motion to recommend approval of the employment agreement and appointment of Myron Franz as Senior Vice President for Finance and Operations. Regent Anderson. Yes. Regent Anderson votes yes. Regent Beeson. Yes. Regent Beeson votes yes. Regent Davenport. Yes. Regent Davenport yes. votes yes. Regent Herr is absent. Regent Chu. No. Regent Chu votes no. Regent Kinyanya. No. Regent Kinyanya votes no. Regent Mayron. Yes. Regent Mayron votes yes. Regent Powell. Regent Powell votes yes. 
Regent Powell. Yes. Regent Powell votes yes. Regent Rocha. No. Rocha votes no. Regent Simonson. Yes. Regent Simonson votes yes. Regent Swigum. Yes. Regent Swigum votes yes. Chair McMillan. Yes. Chair McMillan votes yes. Chair McMillan, there are eight yes votes and three no votes. Very good, Mr. Langworthy. Uh, eight votes in favor, three against. The motion to approve the France contract prevails and is carried. And that takes us to the last item of the day, which is our information items. And I'd ask uh, Interim Senior VP Tonneson to uh, highlight any of those for us before we adjourn. Okay, Mr. Chair, the uh, information items uh, included for the board's reading are, I believe, there are three regular periodic reports, the annual asset management report, the investment advisory committee quarterly updates, and the quarterly purchasing report. In addition to that, we have included a very brief update on the retirement incentive options activity through the end of August. And there is a recording of the urgent approval that was done in early August. And in the interest of time, Mr. Chair, um, that is really it, but we hope that these information items are helpful to the board in, in your review of the university. <clears throat> Thank you. And uh, as always, or not always, but in many cases, the information in that chunk of our, our docket materials is not only informative, it's consequential. So appreciate the time and effort that goes into preparing that for us. It always gets a drive-by here at the end of the meeting, but... It's important stuff. There is uh, no Chair McMillan, Regent Shu has his hand up. Regent Shu, on the information items? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, I just have a quick question regarding the uh, returns on the investments. It, it appears that uh, we lost a significant amount of money at the end. The market is up. And so I'm one, just wondering what has happened since, uh, I guess it was uh, June 30th. If there's anything they can provide for us, that would be great. I don't think we have uh, our chief investment officer here, but perhaps uh, interim senior VP Tonneson, you're ready to answer that, or perhaps Mr. Volna. Uh, Mr. Chair, I can tell you what uh, our chief investment officer told me when I asked him a bit about the report. And beyond that, if there are questions, we can phone him if you want to do that uh, during the meeting. But in before we get there, I can read to you some of what he sent to me. Um, he did say that uh, the results that you see are skewed significantly this year because of the volatility of the public markets in our Q3 and Q4, which meant that the 630-20 public mark that by the 630-20, the public markets had recovered and, re and moved even higher than six months previous. On the other hand, almost 60% of the portfolio is in some form of private partnership or in restricted liquidity structures like hedge funds. So they, they had not yet reported 630 results, but for the most part, we are still using the, the written down March 31st values. So as those funds report their 630 results, they are showing similar large write-ups that will influence very positively the 930 report. So I believe that addresses some of your questions. Some of it is timing in, in when things are being reported and the activity since um, June 30th. Thank you. Good, good question. Thank you, Regent Shu, and thanks for that uh, response and give uh, Vice President Mason our thanks as well. Yeah. Okay, uh, I think that that concludes the business before the Finance and Ops Committee, so I'll have my last chance to use this gavel before Mr. Anderson breaks it later today. <laughs> we stand adjourned. <laughs>